the only limit you, to your child is low expectation. So don't limit them. They already have a challenge. Make that challenge as small as you possibly can and then help them take on the world. As an educator, I knew that they couldn't do that uh, as a, without an assessment and that assessment had to come from a doctor. When I asked his doctor, uh, she was very clear that nothing was wrong. <laughs> um, so my experience with um, IEPs and IEP meetings is that I have to do a lot of time talking to parents and educating them about what an IEP truly means, uh, what it means for their child, what the process truly is, and how we go about getting one. How does this make you a great, effective advocate? Well, first and foremost, automatically if you start out the year right, you have teachers and principals really like, oh, Miss Harvey, she's great, she comes in, she helps, she knows what's going on with her child. Because of the amazing second grade teacher that we had, we started out with a 504. That's what we were encouraged to do. So I just went along with sort of what was, uh, it, you know, suggested to us. And so I looked up what people had to say about IEP so I would know what to be ready for. And what I took from my research was that IEP meetings were horrible and I needed to be ready to fight. And, um, and it was just going to be a bad experience. Navigating the IEP process can be very challenging, especially if it's your first time. It's no cakewalk for schools either. Not only do they have to devote valuable resources for each IEP meeting, each time educating a parent who is new to the process, it can also be emotionally draining. This makes for a very inefficient and often adversarial situation when truly both sides want the best for your child. This documentary aims to bridge that gap and help parents and educators quickly come together for the common goal of providing the best possible education for your child. You'll learn if an IEP or 504 is right for your child and how to best navigate the process if it is. Sponsored by Learning Success, where we help embrace your child's brilliance and unleash their potential, we've brought together over 30 experts on the subject to give you a diverse set of viewpoints and experiences to help you make the right decision and advocate in the best way possible for your child saving you time and frustration, and saving our schools time and resources. We hope you enjoy it. It's good to step back and take a look at the overall picture. What are 504s and IEPs actually for? Dr. Jean Carosio is gonna help us understand that. First, what are IEPs and 504s? Individual education programs are IEPs and 504 plans are official school plans that are designed to do three things. First one, specifically acknowledge a child's learning or behavioral challenges at school. Second, provide a range of school services, accommodations, and modifications. And third, ensure that the student is in the least restrictive learning environment. These school plans formally provide school services and support that should address and manage the student's educational difficulties. However, these plans are not automatically given. Uh, and students have to, are required to officially qualify for them. If the school does not initiate these plans, and most of the time they don't, parents must navigate the educational systems to obtain these services. Parents must write a letter to officially request consideration for IEPs and 504s. And there are examples of these letters on the internet and a number of books. Schools then provide their own educational or case study evaluations to determine if students qualify for the plans. According to federal laws, children and adolescents with ADHD and many other qualifying neuropsychological, psychological, and medical conditions are entitled to receive a free and appropriate education, which includes special accommodations, modifications, and school services. Special education doesn't necessarily mean that a child will be in a separate classroom or will be separated from mainstream classrooms. This is a misunderstanding sometimes that parents might have. By law, Students must be placed as much as possible in mainstream classes until they're determined to require separate special education classrooms. Additionally, it's expensive for schools to maintain these classrooms, so economically it is to the school's advantage to try to mainstream children as much as possible. Read your parental rights. 
those parental rights give you an idea about the rules of the road and so it's really important that you understand what rights you have as a parent and if you have an IEP the IDEA the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act provides a robust set of rights to parents and students and so it's really important that you get a working knowledge of that. Am I asking you to get a law degree and know everything? Absolutely not but you should at a minimum know how you can participate what um, recourse you have if there's a dispute and some of the time frames that are uh, applicable to that so reading the parental rights is a good first place to start and then from there there are a lot of other resources that are out there that can help you understand specific aspects of the law that might come into play if you do have a dispute um, with the school bill cahoy has been in education for over 20 years and now is involved in college admissions. So this gives her a really good perspective to see what happens in the end after high school in an IEP. And she makes some very important distinctions and some very important warnings about how IEPs uh, can be abused and can lead to some unfortunate situations and how this happens in both ends of the economic spectrum. So an IEP um, is, is a great tool for schools to use to be able to um, hold themselves accountable uh, to, to get students uh, the services that they need. Unfortunately, though, it's often overused. Um, and I'm only going to talk about how that's overused with students of color. Um, sometimes when students are not progressing as the school would like or the classroom teacher would like, they are um, given an IEP um, and um, put in special education classes. The problem with that is it's sometimes hard to leave the special education class. Um, so let's say a student is in high school um, and they're ready to, to go into a mainstream algebra class, but they've been in special ed math for the last five years, it's going to be really hard to sort of test into the, the mainstream class. Um, for me as a college counselor, we see when students come who've had IEPs, especially when it um, was mis misdiagnosed, um, and which means that they haven't received the appropriate curriculum for a number of years, and then they, they don't meet the requirements for college. And it's especially unfortunate because if it was appropriately applied, there's plenty of colleges where a student can go with an IEP, um, especially for things that are fairly common, like, in, like ADHD or something like autism. Um, I can also speak to my own son. When my, my own son was in kindergarten and first grade, we spent a lot of money to put him in private school, and, um, and I found out later he was basically sleeping in class, but they were ready to diagnose him with ADHD, dysgraphia, and even autism. Um, but I, as an as a educator, I knew that they couldn't do that um, as a, without an assessment, and that assessment had to come from a doctor. When I asked his doctor, um, she was very clear that nothing was wrong. <laughs> um, after that, we put him in public school, and um, he caught up immediately. Um, they did basic interventions, um, and they noticed because he was catching up so quickly, he wasn't a candidate for special education. Now he just started the fourth grade. He's reading at the level he should be at at the end of fourth grade. Um, and again, that wouldn't have been possible if they had been pulling him out for something that wasn't uh, uh, appropriately um, or wasn't applicable to his situation. And how how does IEP, how do IEP programs typically affect the process of admissions to college for students in general? Mm -hmm. um, what, they, what can they do to make sure that they are addressing their needs, but also the admissions requirements of the college? In general, not just for students of color? Both. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, for students in high school with an IEP, and if the um, accommodations include extra time on a test, uh, they are allowed that same extra time on the SAT or the ACT. In most cases, it, it translates to unlimited time on the SAT or ACT. Um, so if that's an appropriate diagnosis, they certainly should do it. There's also a place on the application where they'll indicate um, what the um, 
diagnosis is. Um, the problem comes when we, when we see the students, um, they oftentimes have these really inflated test scores and these GPAs that don't necessarily match. And it's because, again, how they were maybe pulled out versus what they were actually capable of doing is kind of a mismatch. Um, again, the unfortunate piece is there are plenty of schools that um, um, ha uh, accommodate for all kind of uh, learning differences um, and have offices for those, even you know the most selective schools. So it's, it doesn't necessarily um, help students when they um, try to um, skirt the system in that way, um, because if, if we know what the exact thing is and what a stupid student is capable of, then we could appropriately match them or fit them with a school that would, would meet their needs. Um, but again, what I see, that oftentimes is something that occurs more with students who um, are with means. You know, um, when we work with underserved students, um, they oftentimes don't come with us when they have IEPs because they haven't been given the appropriate coursework. So, so where it looks weird, um, when you see students with means, it will be a really inflated test score, um, but they've been in mainstream classes, so then you're wondering why was the IEP there. For students of color, what you, you'll see is never got the classes that they need. Um, so then you think about college, so didn't even take the SAT, and so you're almost convincing them that they could have done something. So it's like a completely dis different situation, and both stemming from misuse of the IEP. One of the things to consider is that the law requires that the child, the student, your child, be served in the least restrictive environment. What does this mean? It means many different things and it really applies to every child in particular. The least restrictive environment may be a very structured environment for a particular child, maybe a class with eight children or six children. And maybe for another child, it may just be some extra tutoring, some extra help, or maybe even some related services. So what constitutes a least restrictive environment for each particular child depends on that child alone. Over the years, I have found many students receiving special education services who simply needed a more differentiated approach rather than intense interventions and support. As special educators, we are advocates for our students and must ensure the acceptance and sometimes avoidance of an IEP. This responsibility involves ensuring that effective response to interventions have been implemented with fidelity for an adequate amount of time to determine whether the student will be responsive. These interventions are implemented at variant, varying levels of intensity and monitored to determine whether or not the student has demonstrated progress. If in fact the student is not responsive to the intervention selected to address the area of concern and continues to exhibit difficulty within a general education classroom, then a referral for a special education evaluation would be appropriate. So by now we certainly know that an IEP is, is not the first step. Um, if we can avoid it, we want to. If there are other things that we can do before that, and as a matter of fact, those things are mandated before going after an IAP. And as uh, an educator for 20 years, Michelle Person has a lot of experience in this. She spent a lot of time explaining to parents and, and, and getting rid of some of these misconceptions. My personal experience with IEPs are that people come in with a lot of misconceptions. They come in thinking that the IEP is going to be the answer to all of their children's problems. They come in thinking that the IEP process is relatively quick. They come in thinking that um, they can get an IEP just because they because their cousin has one and they think that'll work for their child. Um, so my experience with um, IEPs and IEP meetings is that I have to do a lot of time talking to parents and educating them about what an IEP truly means, uh, what it means for their child, what the process truly is, and how we go about getting one. So it's not a cure-all. Um, it is a list, essentially, of intensive supports that your child will get to help them make them more successful in school. But it will not fix everything overnight. Um, you know, you, you should expect 
another two to three years of hard work to be, because I understand if a child qualifies for an IEP, that means they are significantly below academically. So that means they're probably between two to three grade levels, in some cases even more below where they should be. A child is not going to miraculously make up that much of a deficit in six months. So that's not a realistic expectation. But if you are putting in the work and the effort and the supports are there both at school and at home, that same child in two years time could make four years worth of growth, which would mean that they might transition off of their IEP. So the first thing I try to ex explain to parents is, or my experience is that parents think it's going to be overnight. It's not overnight. It's not overnight to, to see progress. And it's also not overnight, as I explained earlier, to get the IEP. To get the IEP is a process because it is a very intensive um, process. The process itself is, is, is time consuming. Um, you should expect to spend anywhere between four to five months from the time that you say that I would like my child to have this IEP to actually getting the IEP because there are the testing and the interventions and the data collection and the meetings all of that has to happen before the IEP goes in place. So, um, you know, spending time understanding that it's not a cure-all, that it won't happen overnight, but that and that if the testing determines, if the data does not show that the child qualifies for an IEP, then no IEP will be written. Um, it is not a, I think my child wants one. I mean, I think my child needs one. So please write one for them. That is not how it works. Um, you don't just get an IEP because you know that your best friend's cousin got one and it worked for them. So it must, it might work for your child too. Um, you have to go through the process and there is testing that has to be done and the child has to qualify via testing and the data collection to show that they significantly have a deficit that could be repaired with an IEP. So we know that IEPs are not going to be easy. They're not the first step. But Tara Emmerich has a little bit of a different perspective on this. And she's going to tell us that why she decided that going for the IEP instead of a 504 right up out of the gate was a good choice for her. With my middle daughter, who is currently a sixth grader, we started the process of knowing that she too needed some intervention early on in kindergarten. We did not get an IEP in place with her until second grade. I wouldn't even consider a 504 for her because I knew, and this is an important differentiation I think, with a 504, your child will get intervention, they will receive extra support, but they cannot receive support like occupational therapy or speech therapy. My middle daughter has needed occupational therapy. She struggles with dyspraxia. So the occupational therapy piece has been imperative for her. So I pushed for an IEP from the beginning because I wanted her to have access to those outside resources and that outside support. So the best time to consider an IEP is after your child has, you've met with the child's teacher, they have put interventions in place. The teacher has collected data on those interventions that, the, um, that they've been working on. So for example, maybe your child needs smaller assignments. So the teacher spends um, six weeks giving your child a smaller assignment compared to what the peer, their peers might be getting in addition to changing their seat in the classroom so they are closer to the teacher in addition to um, giving them 15 minutes of additional one-on-one -on -one instruction in the classroom. If, your te if the teacher has done all of those things and has tracked your child's progress for six weeks, six to eight weeks, um, and your child is still not catching up or making adequate progress, then you go for a more intensive uh, possible solution when you might consider an IEP. Most schools will actually ask you to do a second round of inter intensive interventions before you go to the IEP because the IEP is the most intensive form of support that you can get.
If after both of those times, so the first six weeks you tried something and it didn't work, and then you go through another six to eight weeks of interventions and those don't work, then the team comes back together and we say, okay, you know what, maybe we need to do some um, testing to see if there's a true deficit that might require an IEP to be written. The school then has 30 days to test the student um, and go over those results with you. So at that time, after the testing is done and the interventions have been taken, have taken place and the data has been presented, all of those things, all of those touch points, the testing, the interventions, the data, um, as a parent, what you know, what you observed about your child are taken into consideration um, and you see if the child qualifies for an IEP. So I think that we could probably all agree that U.S. schools in general are not exactly crushing it. Results just came out and we rank 30th in math, we're 19th in science, we're pretty much in the middle of the pack of the all the developed countries and, and that's pretty alarming considering the power of our country where we're at and, and, and how much has been done in the last years with all the standardized testing and all that. I think that uh, we could probably agree that it's, it's not a perfect system that the and, and you might even say that uh, you know there's a lot of argument here that we are our children are guaranteed an education and they have a right to this uh, an education in this country but i don't think anywhere in the law it says they are guaranteed a good education or comparatively at least to other other countries so i think it's really important to look at what dr kim barron's here has to say, uh, she's going to point out some ways in which the entire system is basically flawed and antiquated. And for a parent, not only should we be looking at what the school system can do, but if we're really concerned, what can we do, obviously at home, uh, but what other systems, what can we learn, what else is out there to help our, our children is um, relying in, entirely on the school system and looking for this IEP to solve it uh, could be a mistake. So let's listen to uh, Dr. Kim Barron's here. I think this is really going to maybe uh, shake it up a bit. Um, I want you to understand that this is a very different perspective than you're, you have been provided with in the past, um, or you, know, you, you, ha you haven't had the opportunity to hear this. Because again, most people who are involved in this process with you are trained very differently. They come from the dominant traditions of psychology, the dominant traditions of education, or even from, med from the medical perspective, which you know, your pediatrician might have been involved at some point inside of this whole thing. So you know, again, I want you to understand that that is, that is one perspective, um, and that sadly is the dominant one that you know, runs the show in education and in our society more generally. But to be quite frank, there's actually a very um, well-established science out there that is extremely pragmatic. And what by pragmatic, I mean we create effective change, we solve problems, and we improve the quality of life for individuals um, you know, of, of all types. So behavioral science is actually the science of learning. And I'm going to repeat that because that's not kind of understood. You know, when people, I don't know what people think when they hear behavioral science, but most of the time you're probably thinking problem behavior, right? We deal with people with real problems, you know, we're dealing with those kinds of behaviors, but that's not necessarily the case. Now, sure, there's branches, there's people in our field that focus on that and that's then they're profoundly effective and, you know, and, and vastly improve the quality of life for people with really serious behavioral issues. However, what's not understood is that behavioral science is actually the science of learning. We are the science of learning, which is kind of an interesting thing to know because we are marginalized and excluded more often than not from educational practices and from what happens in traditional psychology. Because our perspective on, on learning, and again, it's not an opinion, it's based in almost a century of science, kind of goes against the grain of what traditional you know, perspectives are. Um, so what does that mean? So, so from the behavioral perspective, 
you know, learning is actually best defined as the change in behavior over time. Um, you know, that is the only way from a scientific perspective. And again, you know, you have to remember we are in that, you know, behavioral science is a science and not only that, it's a natural science. So similar to chemistry or biology or physics, we study learning with the same scientific methodology. So meaning we observe our phenomenon over time and then we manipulate specific variables in the environment and evaluate their effects over time. And so we do this in the area of, of behavior, which is the only observable evidence we have that learning has occurred. So, so, so that being said, so we define at learning as a change in behavior over time, because to be quite honest, that's the only way we can know that learning has taken place, that something changes, right? So for instance, when a child is reading, the only way we know that their reading is improving is if we watch them reading over time and we somehow, and we are experts in knowing how to do this, uh, you know, design a way to measure reading behavior such that we can evaluate if reading is improving over time. And so our fundamental measure in our science is actually count per minute. And again, there's a century of science that suggests that this is the most pre precise and sensitive and reliable measure of learning. So count per minute. So for instance, 100 words read correctly per minute. That is a, that is a scientific measure of reading behavior that comes from the science of learning or behavioral science. Uh, you know, in math, you might look at, you know, number of correct math problems completed per minute. Um, you might look at, you know, number of correct equations identified per minute. So everything is measured as count per minute. And what this has allowed us to discover as a science is that the, the, the most, you know, number one precise and sensitive measure of learning is count per minute or count per time. And another is that the most, that the, the, the way to evaluate mastery of a behavior is by looking at something called fluency. So fluency is also measured as count per minute. But what we have discovered in our science, which coincides with, 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 with what happens in neuroscience, is that as, as we engage in repeated reinforced practice of a behavior over time, that behavior becomes more and more rapid. That behavior becomes like a, a, at a higher pace, more correct or, or you know, errorless or accurate. All right. And then there comes there comes a point where that behavior hits the ceiling and can't improve anymore because it's occurring at the pace at the highest pace it can. And then what we've discovered is when kids achieve that level of fluency or automaticity, effortlessness, other ways you can talk about that. When children achieve that level of fluency, three things reliably occur. Number one, that behavior is neurologically permanent. What does that mean? It, it is remembered. It is remembered over long periods of time, even in the absence of ongoing practice. So number one, when children achieve fluency, which is a true measure of mastery of a skill or a behavior, that's something the child does, then that is neurologically permanent. It doesn't go away, all right? Number one. Number two, when children achieve fluency, there is a grand resistance to distractions and fatigue. What does that mean? That means that fluency increases attention span. Now keep that in the back of your hat because let's think about all the ADD diagnoses that are happening out there. So attention span is improved. And number three, children are more likely to apply skills easily, easily and effortlessly for the learning of more complex things. All right, so our science, which again is not, not well liked by the establishment, it is marginalized, has discovered that when you, ha when you have repeated reinforced practice of skills, over time, they move to a, a level of mastery called fluency, which produces neurological permanence, increases in attention span, and the ability to apply skills to learning more difficult things, which should be the, the basic outcomes of what education should produce. That's what we should be wanting our kids to do. Sadly, the educational establishment is not based on our science at all. They don't allow us in there unless it's dealing with kids with profound disabilities. We aren't involved because education isn't based on science. It's based on opinions and traditions and beliefs that go back, you know, since the turn of the 20th century. It's archaic. So they haven't evolved. 
So sadly, what's now happened is because kids are moved ahead in the grade levels based on age, not based on mastery of skills. What happens? Kids are moved ahead because we're, you know, the expectation out there because of developmental psychology and developmental theory, which is all theory. The theory is that kids are going to improve and be able to learn more complicated things because they've turned a year older, which is not correct. And our science has demonstrated this. Learning cognitive or academic skills is not a function of development or age. It's a function of a very specific kind of training, like anything, tennis, golf, a musical instrument, chess, math, reading. All of those things are based on training. Those are things we do, and those are things we have to learn, and we have to learn them via instruction. So sadly, when instruction is not designed based on science, but based on opinions and traditions, Many, many kids fail. 60% of the American population of students fail to achieve proficiency by the time they graduate. And that is a fact. You can look that up on the National um, Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP. Go to the website. 60% of American school children graduate below proficiency. So 60% of kids fail. The educational system fails 60% of kids. So we shouldn't be surprised that some of those failures are now being medicalized meaning the blame is being placed on the child and it's being suggested that they have a learning disability or something inherently wrong with them that is promoting or producing this failure. However, I will tell you right now in my 20 year career with thousands and thousands of learners, less than 1% of the time are children impaired because of some neurological learning problem. More often than not, they have been classified for a learning disability because they have been instructionally failed and they have been moved ahead through the grade levels without true mastery of core component skills being achieved. And as a function, they, they can't function at the level they're expected to function because their core skills are not in place. And what do they need? They only, only need effective fluency-based instruction so that they can have repeated reinforced practice of skills to mastery and then successfully move up the ladder. We have repeated these outcomes with thousands of kids for 20 years. And most of them were either classified for the learning problem or on the way to being classified. And guess what? There was no learning problem. The problem lies in the instructional environment and the fact that education refuses to evolve. So as parents, if I can leave you with anything, it is the distinction that if you have not yet gone down this road and you've been told that your child is ha probably has a learning disability, needs to have a neuropsychological evaluation, please, if, if I can you know, it, it do anything for you, is find a way of getting them a, a skills assessment, a core skills assessment, so that your child's core academic skills can be looked at with precision and can be identified as where are they not masterful because I promise you they're not because education doesn't allow children the time or use the kind of methodologies required to produce that kind of mastery with kids. So more often than not your children have no core mastery and skills but they're expected to function as if they do and when they can't they're labeled as having a learning problem which absolves the educational establishment of responsibility of educating them effectively, and it medicalizes the problem. Psychological evaluations and all of those things don't look at learning at all. They look at your child's performance on one test. And as a function of that performance on one test, and let me tell you, it's performance, it's behavior on one test, and inference is made about why they performed that way. The inference being they have dyslexia. They have dyscalculia. They have some auditory or, or visual processing disorder. But that has never been directly measured. That is an inference made based on the performance on a test by which there are many other explanations for why they perform that way. Number one being they haven't mastered the skills required to perform well, which is a much more simple, pragmatic explanation that is based in your child's history of instruction and lack of skill mastery and the solution pragmatically is going in there and providing your child the, the kind of reinforced practice required to achieve true mastery of skills so that they can be independent vital successful kids if there's anything that i hope to accomplish in my career 
It is creating power for parents by having distinctions that they don't have around what is going wrong with the way your child is being educated and how your child is now being blamed for the fact that education doesn't work for the masses. And now your child's being medicalized for that failure. But the failure isn't your child's failure. The failure is the failure of the system. And you need to know that. So there's my contribution to you. And you can, you know, I don't know, find, you can, you know, again, I'm Dr. Kim Barons. You can Google me and find me everywhere. I'm happy to, to have further conversations with anyone who's interested about this because it's the passion of my life. Nearly every expert we talk to stress the importance of collaboration collaboration. Since this is a situation which could very quickly get adversarial, it's important to have ideas on collaboration, use techniques to make sure that collaboration ensues, and really show up showing that you are willing to collaborate. So we're going to listen to each of the experts and their talking about the importance of collaboration and giving tips on a how to ensure that that happens. We'll start with Shimri Yoyo. I want to say, you know, um, you want to approach the IEP meeting as a time of collaboration. Um, well, oftentimes, unfortunately, when um, I met with some parents, it, sometimes they brought in an adversarial um, attitude or disposition towards the, the meeting, and it was kind of us versus them, and it, it, it can be a stressful time. And one of the ways that you can, um, <laughs> to eliminate that stress is to go into it with an open mind and, and wanting to really work together to, to provide the best uh, learning environment and situation for your child. Next we have Nicole Black, who points out that educators really are on your side. The second thing you need to know that really helps me is I'm an ex um, elementary school teacher. I was in my fair share of IEP meetings before I became a mom. And what you need to know is that educators, we go into it because we love kids. Okay, 90%, 98% of us go into it because we love kids. We genuinely want to see them succeed. So go into this IEP meeting knowing that these educators who get paid very little for what they do are there because they love their profession, they love children, and they want to see your kids succeed. Going in knowing that puts you on the same side. Like literally you are fighting the same battle. You want what's best for your child. They may come at it in a different direction or have different ideas, or maybe they're seeing it from a different perspective, but they are, they want what's best for your child. If you go in with that assumption, it's going to be a lot smoother. The other thing I always bring in as I bring in sugar, sugar can just alleviate a lot of stress in the room. So I bring in either a plate of cookies um, or I go grab some donut holes at the local donut shop and I put it on the table and I say, ladies and gentlemen, help yourself. We, I'm sure you've been doing this for a while. We all need a little sugar pick me up. It is always appreciated. And it's not a peace offering of sorts, but it's kind of, it just breaks the ice and it makes people kind of, it just, oh, take, you take a breath. Okay, she's a real person. She knows that we need sugar. And it's just, it kind of makes everything a little bit sweeter. And that is what I try to do at every single meeting. I just had her IEP meeting last year. I brought in some donut holes, left them on the table as I walked out the door, and I saw them all like diving in for it, which is fantastic because they had more meetings right after mine. Dana Stahl points out that this is going to be a long-term working relationship. It is also important to build a working relationship and to know who is on your team. Remember, at a team meeting, parents have an equal voice. There are many people who gather around the table at your parent-teacher meetings and at committee of special education meetings, and they can include general education teachers, special education teachers, a school district representative, a parent representative, school psychologist, and a translator if necessary. It is important to maintain an open line of communication with teachers, service providers, and school principals. Be mindful and curious and ask questions and document the answers of your child's level of academic performance, class participation, 
social emotional behavior and attention. Parents, it is important to understand that educators, service providers, and school administrators entered the field of education to help children feel successful. Parents who are able to ask for help in supporting their children in a disarming manner, let the schools know that you understand that they are the professionals who want to help guide, assist, and work with your children to achieve common goals. By taking these steps, parents will find building level support in meeting these goals. The homeschool partnership is essential to your children's academic and social emotional growth. By working together, your children will feel supported at school and at home and will find strategies in which to succeed. Remember, as parents, you are your child's best advocate. The ability to see something from a, another person's perspective is critical to negotiations. And Carissa West is going to help us see things from the teacher's perspective. I think the best thing that you can do, um, aside from trying to remember that this is, this is an effort to help your child, is to remember that everyone is, is doing and recommending what they think is best. Sometimes parents think a child needs accommodations and the student or the staff does not. And sometimes the parent's right, right? You know your child best. However, sometimes what you know about your child is what you see in your child at home and what teachers and administrators and special ed case managers, they see a different side of your child at school. And sometimes those pictures look very similar, but sometimes they're going to look different. So just because you and someone else on the team may not always agree on the best approach, it doesn't mean that it needs to be an antagonistic relationship it should be a cooperative conversation um, because the ultimate goal is to do what's best for your child and to ultimately help them so that one day they can move on to the next grade and the next grade and eventually be, you know, as a high school teacher, I see this a lot, a successful college student or adult in the working world. Um, and so our goal is to try to work incrementally. Um, our job is to work incrementally towards those ultimate goals for your child. Um, sometimes case managers and teams, they change. They'll change a little bit from year to year because your child will move from one grade to the next, and so their teachers will change. But other times the teams will change because of transitions. Case managers leave. People transfer. The caseloads are shuffled, sometimes alphabetically. So you may not always be working with the same people from one year to the next. And I think it's really helpful to try to take a fresh approach with each new team. Um, Sometimes teams work great together. It's a, it's a really symbiotic relationship and it seems to have a lot of synergy and you work well with them, you understand one another, and then someone on the team changes and you may not feel as comfortable with them or you may not feel as if you guys connect as well. Um, but try not to let your previous experiences color the conversations and experiences with the new team. The same can be true in reverse. You might have had not that great of an experience the last time. Maybe you didn't you know, have see eye to eye with your child's case manager last year. Now they have a new one. Try not to let your skepticism or maybe disappointment in the way that that relationship had been in the past color the relationship with the new team. Um, taking this fresh approach each time and trying to keep the ultimate goal at the center of the conversation is really going to help you get the most out of these meetings every year, sometimes more than once a year for your child. And Chris Reichert tells us that building rapport may be one of the most powerful things we can we can do in advocating for a child. How do parents advocate for their child at school? I often receive this question from clients and parents of students that I teach. The best way to advocate for your child is to build rapport with the school, your child's teacher, and those that support your child in school. To build rapport, it is best to be available, have open two-way communication with your child's teachers and school, get involved in your child's education, for example, through the PTO or PTA, ask your child's teachers how you can support what is being taught at school, at home, and most importantly, be kind, courteous, and friendly. It goes a long way. In addition to those things, when meeting with any school personnel, it is very important to never bring emotions into a meeting. 
Motions will shut down conversation with school personnel and will not result in any positive outcome for any individual. You as the parent are the advocate for your child. Being an advocate is imperative. Don't take no for an answer. I also think, though, it's really, really important to recognize that in general, I think our teachers and educators are very well-meaning. They have great intention. They are doing an incredibly challenging and difficult job that I cannot imagine doing, and to have great respect and gratitude for them is imperative. I stepped into every meeting with that sense of respect and gratitude for my child's teacher, and at the same time was strong in my voice and my opinion. And I feel like it's important to navigate the system as a team. You want your child's teacher on your team. You need to be an important team member. You want your child to be a team member. So I think that coming into the whole situation, seeing your child's teacher as an ally is really important. Obviously there might be circumstances or situations where that's not the case. And then you need to go outside. Um, so coming in with that attitude of gratitude, so to speak, I think is imperative, but strong, stay true to what you know to be true about your child. Don't take no for an answer. It's a long and arduous process. Um, I think if I had to do it all over again, I would have pushed a little harder, a little bit sooner with my middle daughter to get her on an IEP. Um, I understand that there's things in place and they want to get to know the kids and they want to sort of make sure that that's really what they need. But if you step back and just kind of let them figure it out, it might not happen. So be vocal, be strong, be present, be in direct communication with your child's teacher and your child's school. Um, Be appreciative. It's really important to not burn bridges, even though anger is valid. It can be a really frustrating experience. And if you, as a parent, have done a really great job of all of this collaboration stuff, coming in with a good attitude, listening, but yet strongly advocating, what you have done is what Nashima Harvey calls building a school tribe. Let's listen to Nashima talk about the power of a school tribe. Create a school tribe. Your school tribe will have the basic people in it, principal, you, and teachers. You could add secretaries, security guards, you can add whoever you want, but you just want to let everybody know that you love your child and you are very involved and you love working with the school to make this an awesome school year. No hostility. You just want to show it's all love. We're here to help the kids. We're here for the kids. We're, We're really involved in the process. How does this make you a great, effective advocate? Well, First and foremost, automatically, if you start out the year right, you have teachers and principals really like, oh, Miss Harvey, she's great. She comes in, she helps, she knows what's going on with her child. That goes a long way. Building relationships goes a long way. The internet can be a negative place, a very negative place. Unfortunately, when it comes to IEPs, that can lead to a lot of problems because very commonly in Facebook groups, Um, And across the web, you will find people really complaining a lot about IEPs. And the general idea that you can get from this is that IEPs are just automatically adversarial. They can be, but it's not always the case. And Melanie Musson is going to point out uh, the importance of walking in with a non-adversarial and her experience on how she thought that was gonna be different because of her internet research. And so we had an IEP meeting um, scheduled and I am part of several um, Facebook groups of special need parents. And so I looked up what people had to say about IEP so I would know what to be ready for. And what I, took from my research was that IEP meetings were horrible and I needed to be ready to fight and um, and it was just going to be a bad experience. So I was nervous when I went to the first meeting and I cried and not really for any reason. It was just my nerves. And as the meeting progressed, I started to wonder why I was so ready to fight. 
because her teacher that was heading up the meeting was on my side. She wanted the best things for my daughter. She is brilliant. She knows the law. She knows what my daughter's entitled to, and she's committed to seeing her students excel. And so after that first meeting, the ones, the next two years of preschool, those meetings went great. I wasn't, um, I wasn't prepared to fight because I knew that this teacher was on my side and the IEP meetings were a wonderful experience. And then my daughter transitioned to kindergarten and her, um, so that IEP meeting to get ready for kindergarten went very well because her preschool teacher headed up that meeting and she, she knew what my daughter, the services she should get. And she knew what, um, the ways that she could write into the plan, how to be, how my daughter could be helped best. And so, um, so that was a good meeting. And then my daughter's kindergarten year did not go well. She, um, she didn't thrive like she had thrived in preschool. She didn't like going to school. Um, and it just, it wasn't a good experience. And then after seeing how things weren't going great, I had ideas for how to make things better. Things that we could do to help her, things that we could um, do so that she would learn and thrive the very best way that she could. And when I went to that meeting, after the end of kindergarten, getting ready for first grade, the um, the people in the meeting from the school were not on my side. And it was not a good experience. And I was fighting. And um, so I've seen both ends of how an IEP meeting can go. It can go great. And it can go where it feels like a fight. But some things that I learned is to expect it to go well. So don't go into it thinking, this is gonna be bad and I'm ready to fight. Go into it expecting the best. You'll know if it doesn't go, if it's not going well and you're not um, seeing them meeting the needs of your child, you'll know and then you can deal with that. But don't expect it to go bad, expect it to go well. So first I wanna just sort of set the framework and make sure that all of our understanding is in the same place. If you have a child with an IEP or an individualized education program, they are protected under federal law and they are entitled to a program that essentially provides them with a free appropriate public education in their least restrictive environment. Obtaining that can be a challenge and so I want to definitely make sure I am abundantly clear that this is a marathon and not a sprint and therefore it's really important that you pace yourself. It's also really important that you think strategically about the relationships that you have with individuals in the building, recognizing that your child is in somebody else's care for the majority of the day. And whether you have a dispute or not over something related to special education or discipline or any of the ways that issues come up, your child is often going to be going back to school there. So I say that to say, it's important to operate with grace and integrity and respect throughout the process, even though it can be extremely frustrating. And that's not to say you have to minimize your feelings or not speak up when you're concerned. It's just to remind you to be thoughtful about how you are approaching the situation. And finally, Emily Denbell Morrison reminds us of the power of thank you. Special educators are the most undervalued under-recognized educators in our profession today. And so often they have mountains of paperwork, IEP meetings, testing, and they clearly love children or they wouldn't be doing this job. So saying thank you when you begin a meeting with them really does help them feel appreciated because it's a hard job. In this next section of the episode, we are going to speak about emotions, your emotions. IEP meetings are inherently emotion, emotional and emotional emotions can get very elevated, possibly on both sides. So we need to be prepared for that. 
let's first listen to some advice from Nicole Black. This knot in the middle of your stomach and it just can feel so intense. And so I want to give you a couple tips to help alleviate some of that so that you feel a little bit more prepared. Um, you can walk through it a little bit easier and it's not quite so traumatic. I can't take all of it away because I still feel it. I still, I eat P days, man. My stomach just, oh, the, the stress of it and the anxiety of it. So it doesn't go away, but we can reduce it. We can limit it. It's not uncommon for parents to get so emotional that they simply just don't ask for everything that they want. And Dana Stahl is going to talk about that and the importance of bringing a friend for support. A parent who I recently was working with in preparation for her meeting uh, did prepare for questions and concerns. But once at the meeting, she said, I did not ask for additional accommodations at this point. I more or less wanted to hear what her teachers and support staff had to say. I was very pleased to hear the progress Leah is making and that they are enjoying working with her. Leah's mother was not comfortable asking for things without sounding completely competent, as this is not her area of expertise. She said, I felt like I was winning simply because I didn't cry at this meeting. For parents who need support, please bring a friend, an advocate, or someone in the field of education to sit beside you and be there to support you. It is important to remain calm and carry on. My biggest advice to parents when it comes to approaching these meetings is to remember that it is a team meeting. Um, everyone is on the same side, and that side is to try to get your child the accommodations that they need to be successful in the classroom, whether that's the general education classroom, whether it's a, um, a, a self-contained classroom, whether it's a classroom that's inclusive but has the aid of a special education teacher or assistant. The scale or the continuum of assistance for students varies pretty widely from age and grade and demonstrated need. Um, but one thing that can be really, really challenging for parents, and as a mom myself, I completely understand why this is, is to leave emotions at the door, right? We're talking about your baby, your child, and you want what's best for them. And that can be a really emotionally charged situation, which everybody understands. But the more that you can try to separate yourself a little bit from the emotional side of it and focus on the, the practical side, the, the better off that you'll be, the better off your child will be, and I think the better the progress the IEP team will make. This isn't saying that you have to come in like a robot. Um, all of the, the teachers, the specialists, the administrators, they understand that this is your child they're talking about, and they care about your child too. Um, but sometimes it can be a real challenge for a parent to, to separate what's being said about their child and how to help their child from, you know, feelings about their child personally, and, and they're not the same thing, right? Um, as a teacher, I might love your child. I might think they're um, incredibly special and fun, and I might enjoy having them in class, but I might also see that they are having real challenges or real difficulties, um, and they're not meeting kind of the expectations for their academic or developmental level, and I want to make sure that as a professional, as a teacher, that I am helping your kid get the accommodations that they need to be successful in the classroom. And so the conversation is often going to center around what, what's not happening and what needs to happen, what needs to change. Um, and that can be really tough for parents. Um, the IEP process has been set up in a way that teachers and professionals are encouraged to consider the student's strengths and to discuss the student's strengths um, as part of the meetings and as part of the discussions. But more often than not, parents especially are going to find um, that they, they really focus on the parts where, where their child is struggling and falling short. And that can be a really difficult situation to be in. So just knowing that prior to going into the meeting can help you maintain kind of a sense of calm and try to get a handle on your emotions. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to feel stressed. It's okay to cry, right? There's usually tissues at these meetings, especially in the early years when parents are still getting their bearings um, and trying to figure out how to best navigate this process for their child. Barbara Harvey reminds us to first take care of yourself. You need to make sure that you're taking care of yourself. You need to make sure that 
you are getting your needs met, you're, you're going, you're finding out what support programs are around for parents with children with that issue and how find out from other people what they did, what works for their child and, and, and get that support that you need. You're not alone in this. You're, you're, you're not the only parent with a child with this issue. So get, reach out there and get uh, your best resources, other parents who understand where you are, who've seen what you're seeing, and can give you some ideas to support and to help. Find community. No one should special education alone. It can be a very long and exhausting process. And so I highly recommend that you find other parents who also have children in special education. Um, if you can find individuals at your school or in your district, that's really helpful because they also have an understanding of how things work in those particular spaces. But I also think it's important to just generally find um, community around either parents who have children with the same disability or are just going through or in a, a sorry, uh, dealing with the same types of issues. And there are a lot of online communities as well. Facebook has a lot of special education communities related to specific exceptionalities. Uh, and I think it's just really important to make sure that there's a space for you to gather information, to get encouraged, um, to be reminded that you need to take a break, to be reminded that you're doing a great job. And I will also state that with finding community uh, wherever possible, I highly, highly recommend that you take someone with you to an IEP meeting because they can often be really overwhelming. Um, and sometimes even the dynamics of one parent surrounded by 8 to 12 educators can be intimidating. So I think it's really important to have someone with you for emotional support and also just another set of ears to hear what's going on and take notes. And before we end this section on emotions, I just want to give one more reminder from M Emily Denbo Morrison on the importance of bringing a friend. If they are diagnosed with a learning difference and you are at that initial IEP meeting, chances are you're feeling really overwhelmed because this is all new to you. And I think it's a good idea, especially in these initial IEP meetings, to bring another adult with you, another family member, significant other, a friend, who can be another set of ears. They can take notes, they can ask questions, they can hear the things that you might be missing because, again, you're really worried about the outcome. Getting a diagnosis for your child is a highly personal decision. There uh, is a lot to think about with that, and that's far beyond the scope of, of this. But we want to give some different opinions uh, from different sides, from parents and um, educators and child advocates alike. Uh, and there's also the consideration of whether you should or can get the diagnosis done within the school system or should it be done by a professional? So let's let's start this off with uh, Tara Amrek, who's gonna give her experience in that situation. So I was aware of IEPs and 504s before that because I am a social worker by training and I was a school social worker for a year in a public middle school and was part of some of the team decision making meetings and coming together with students who were getting IEPs. So I had some awareness, but I really didn't truly understand all that went into it until I became a parent of two children who needed extra support in school. So because of the amazing second grade teacher that we had, we started out with a 504. That's what we were encouraged to do. So I just went along with sort of what was, uh, it, you know, suggested to us in order for my daughter to qualify for a 504, she had to be officially diagnosed with something, which that in and of itself, I think is, I have different feelings about that. Um, but I also feel like there is a time and a place where you have to sort of play with 
in the rules of the system. So her pediatrician diagnosed her as ADD, which was not a made-up diagnosis. She d- certainly displayed various behavior types that go along with attention deficit disorder. I actually really believe that she was suffering more from PTSD and not ADD, and, and it just manifested in similar behavior. Nevertheless, we went with the ADD diagnosis because we knew that it would get us a 504. We didn't necessarily know that we could push hard for that evaluation, so we actually sought out outside evaluations for both of our daughters. Um, They were both evaluated by a um, educational psychologist. We had to pay out of pocket for that. It was incredibly expensive. We are lucky and fortunate and privileged enough to have the means to do that. I I realize that obviously not every family is able to do that, um, which is frustrating to me that that is something that is a truth. So know that you don't have to have outside testing in order for your child to get evaluations um, or to be evaluated. Rather, my middle daughter school did the same exact tests that we had already received to her or that she'd already been tested on, but they needed to have it within the system. So in some ways, I guess the outside educational testing was helpful because it just gave us better ideas as to how they were learning and what was going on with them. Dr. Keisha Walker tells us that a lot should actually be done before even considering a diagnosis. Avoidance should be taken against those who see a student struggling and immediately suggest the need for an evaluation without employing any research-based interventions. As we know, students learn differently and all students respond to instructional strategies and interventions differently. As a result, all children should be afforded opportunities to increase their skills and abilities through the selection of strategies and interventions that are aligned specifically to support their individual needs and abilities. An immediate request for testing and or the development of an IEP is just not appropriate and should be avoided. When a child is struggling in school and has been, they are likely going to try to mask that struggle uh, in a variety of ways. This could be uh, temper tantrums. It could just be simply by acting cute and using charm to get past it. Uh, It could be some extreme behavioral problems. It could manifest um, as headaches, uh, illness, you know, sick to stomach, um, could be procrastination. There's There's so many techniques. Kids are actually pretty brilliant in coming up with these. And so... Uh, this actually goes very unrecognized as the, the core problem. Um, and a lot of people will assume that the behavior is the core problem and the behavior is really actually a symptom. So and Emily Denbo Morrison is going to talk about that. When to consider getting a referral or a test for your child. This can be a really hard decision because... Oftentimes, learning differences present themselves in behavioral ways, particularly ADHD, dyslexia, processing deficits, reading, um, numeracy issues. Children can appear as if they don't want to learn. They can't focus. They won't pay attention. They're easily distracted. They're not following instructions. They won't stop moving. They can't get organized. They don't want to read or they don't want to write. Often, this behavior can distract parents and teachers from the very real cognitive impairment that's going on inside a child. So when you see one or two or three of these red flags, this may be normal. Every child, every learner struggles with paying attention or motivation. But when a child has most, if not all, of these red flags popping up at the same time, usually this signals that there is a significant learning impairment going on. Talk to your doctor, talk to your child's teachers, 
talk to other adults who understand your child well. And if they're seeing the same things and share the same concerns, it's a good idea to get them tested. The whole diagnosis is kind of a dilemma. It's a very personal decision. There's research that needs to be done to know if schools in your area are responsible for doing a diagnosis. And then that may it may be a consideration that you want an outside diagnosis. So we're going to hear from Eileen B. Miller, who strongly argues for an outside diagnosis. Please, before you go into your meeting, please have a formal diagnosis from a pediatric neurologist. It is very important. Schools will base an IEP on the formal diagnosis that they are given. What you do not want is for the school to run tests and to give you a diagnosis. Usually, in many cases, the school's assessments are skewed in their favor and therefore do not reflect an actual diagnosis or an actual result. This is extremely important. If your child does end up getting a diagnosis through the school, that will likely be done in large part by a school psychologist. So let's listen to Melissa Green, who is a school psychologist, and she'll tell us exactly what that is and what a school psychologist does. And you're probably wondering, what is a school psychologist? Many people have told me that they have never heard of a school psychologist. So um, the role, the primary role of school psychologists is generally to conduct psychological or psychoeducational evaluations and provide consultation to the um, educators as to how they can best support the children in their classroom. Um, prior to a child being evaluated by a school psychologist, um, there may be several meetings with um, members at the school, team members at the school, as well as with parents to discuss a child's progress or lack thereof, and to discuss what type of interventions have been in place and what other types of inter interventions may be considered to implement. Um, after all of those things have been exhausted, and it appears that the child or adolescent is not making adequate progress, then a teacher and a parent may decide that um, they want to have a child or adolescent evaluated. And that evaluation usually consists of tests that look at um, their intellectual functioning, their academic skills, uh, maybe uh, behavior rating scales to see how um, they exhibit certain behaviors in the school environment versus the home environment or the community. Um, also, uh, there may be rating scales to screen for any type of emotional difficulties. Dr. Jean Carosio brings up a very important distinction between educational testing and diagnosis. So what do IEPs and 504s not provide? Uh, parents should know that after school testing, many schools do not provide specific clinical diagnoses such as a reading learning disorder or ADHD. Public schools typically provide educational testing and while psychologists provide uh, psychological testing. So they are different. These tests are different. School psychologists are not clinical psychologists and they have different training, credentials, and professional roles. School evaluations are limited and often brief. Most schools do not comprehensively assess what emotional, psychological, or behavioral problems or conditions a child may have and may only loosely refer to these. This is unfortunate because parents sometimes can lack a full understanding of the magnitude of the child's problems or conditions or challenges and the critical need for outside providers. When children receive school services exclusively without outside providers complementing services, parents can have a false sense that the child's problems are being adequately addressed and many times they're not. Um, parents can be unaware that the child has a neurodevelopmental condition that might require more services or treatment that schools cannot and do not provide. 
Some schools are simply reluctant to complain to parents about the child's problems until they can't be avoided any longer. Parents can be motivated to approach outside behavioral health providers only after the child continues to struggle and suffer and have more severe or frequent school problems or complaints. Some teachers are even instructed by school administration not to specifically discuss their concerns with parents um, that, they might, that, the, that they suspect that a child might have a learning disorder or ADHD. Fortunately, having a mental health or a medical diagnosis from an outside provider can greatly assist students in qualifying for 504s and IEPs. These are required for 504 plans in most cases. Clinicians can assist families with the process of requesting school services by writing a letter to the school uh, that states their diagnoses and recommends that they receive a 504 or an IEP. Letters or psychological testing reports from outside providers typically help to substantiate the need uh, for a 504 and IEP. Indeed, it's harder for schools to minimize a parent's request for school services when outside providers are involved. If you've decided on an IEP or have or are deciding on an, an IEP, it's also really important to understand what are the long-term goals of an IEP. And Michelle Pearson is going to help us out with that. Um, it is not a fix or a cure-all. It is a very long process, um, both to get the IEP and to work towards working themselves off of the IEP. Um, and that should be a goal. Um, people should not think that an IEP is going to immediately fix all of their children's problems because it's not. It is a continuous, it's part of a process. Um, an IEP is something that is monitored every year um, to check to make sure the children are continuing to make progress, to see if there are any different interventions that need to be in place, and to see if anything needs to be changed. So can something be taken out? Can something be added in to make the child more successful? The end goal for probably 80% of IEPs should be to move the child off of the IEP, to put the most intensive interventions possible in place to make sure that the child catches up and is able to figure out a way to access traditional curriculum with their peers um, and be able to perform without any supports. Additionally, to consider at the very young ages in the elementary school is what's called an individualized family services plan, uh, which is gonna help the school and, the, and families and the child all work together. In early childhood, the plan for working with the child is not an individual education plan. It's called an individualized family services plan. And the goal around that is to make sure that home and school and everywhere that child goes and all the adults in their lives know what their skills are, what they're practicing, and is helping them to develop those skills that they need so that they can move past whatever the issue is, and go on with life. If they do need help, that you are meeting with professionals who can give them the help that they need, and that there's a plan in place for you, for your family, for your friends, for the Early Childhood Center, and all of that to really come together to give support to your baby so that they can grow and become whoever they're meant to be. Next, we're going to be talking about preparing for an IEP. Something you really want to do is, is be totally prepared so you can achieve the best outcome. Prior to that, we really want to make sure that this is exactly what you need to do. An IEP is a difficult process. It's not something you want your child to be in long term if possible. And if you can avoid it at all, that would be a much better outcome. So let's listen to what school psychologists author and educator Nicole Thompson has to say about this before we actually get into the nitty gritty of putting together, of preparing for this IEP. So above all, my most important takeaway in this video is to exhaust all possibilities before you actually request testing. And the reason I say this is because there's a saying in the mental health field, in the field of psychology, that if you're looking for a disability, you will almost certainly find one. So in other words, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. And if you're constantly focusing on your weaknesses and seeking out things to confirm your weaknesses, then most likely you'll uh, be eligible or you'll qualify for a disability. 
So before you get there, I want you to exhaust your possibilities. So the first thing is to actually go to tutoring. And tutoring is easy and it's something that is readily available. Tutoring can happen in numerous ways. You can get after school tutoring. I know they offer that at many schools for free. So see if there's any after school tutoring in your child's school. Also peer tutoring when your student is being uh, tutored by someone in their class or by a peer that's a couple of uh, a um, couple of years older in a couple of grades higher than they are. They can tutor them there as well. Also, you can ask your teacher or a teacher assistant to help your student when they have time, if they're willing, and tutor them that way. You can also pay for tutoring, which is another option. So the first thing I want you to do if your student is struggling is to get tutoring. I want you to use the internet. The internet has so many different things and so many platforms for learning and sharpening your skills. And depending on how old your child is, that's how you pick the different um, platforms and all. So just to name a couple of um, popular ones out there, ABC Mouse, depending on your child's age. Um, and also one of my favorites is Khan Academy, and that's K-A-H-N Academy. What it does is it... Uh, offers different opportunities and problems for your child to really practice on the skills that they need to be successful in school. So use the internet, all of those great um, learning opportunities that they have out there. And I'm pretty sure that you could find some on YouTube as well. And echoing that same sentiment of exhausting everything is Dr. Ingrid Amarini Klimak. And she is actually going to give us a few more suggestions along those lines and how you can work with the school in exhausting all those possibilities before jumping into that IEP. So the first thing that you need to do as a parent when you are navigating or exploring, you know, possibly having an IEP for your child is to see if there was anything that was done before. For example, have you or has the school tried um, extra supports? Has the school tried tutoring? Has the school tried um, setting them apart for your child? Or have they tried different methods or different approaches? Everything that would be tried with, um, with any normally developing child should be tried with any child regardless of level and those options need to be explored before an IP is even considered so when you're thinking about does my child need an IP really think about what was done before have a conversation with the administration at the school with the principal with the system principal with the teacher also with the school psychologist uh, those people uh, should be able to give you feedback on what was what methods, what strat strategies and techniques were already utilized in order to teach a child. If you feel that you know you've tried at home, the school has tried that you know that the answers that you're getting are satisfactory to you, and you feel that you need to move forward, then maybe the next step is to request an IEP review. So at this point, you have uh, exhausted a lot of the possibilities outside of an IEP. You've worked hard on skills development. There's uh, obviously a problem there, so there's some struggle. Of course, you have started the learning success system, so you're building up the foundations of learning. You're building up confidence and self-esteem so that your child is ready to take on these things. And you're now thinking that you need to have an IEP so that you can build a scaffolding for your child and eventually get off of this IEP is, is the hopes. So with that in mind, one thing to consider is your own emotions about this and how you're going to deal, this, deal with this. And Dr. Carol Lieberman is going to speak to us about that. Now, my uh, advice as a psychiatrist with this experience is, first of all, to not be afraid of speaking up and demanding a, an IEP. Don't be afraid of asking for one in the first place. Uh, that is a problem that so many parents have. They think, you know, oh, well, maybe my child doesn't need it and other kids need it more, 
or maybe they won't grant an IEP to me uh, for my child, or um, sometimes parents have too much pride to ask for an IEP. They don't want to believe that their child has some kind of learning issue that an IEP would help them for. And that usually is because of parents um, identifying too much with kids or with their kids. And, um, you know, it brings back feelings that they had when they were in school and not, you know, wanting to feel smarter or smart enough and so on. So it's all these different kinds of issues that can get in the way in the first place for asking for an IEP. Let's get a quick overview of the entire ID process. So we know from beginning to end, and we're gonna get some help on that from Winifred Winston, who has a lot of experience with this with her own child. Understanding the eight steps in the IEP process. So I really wanna delve into each one. And I'm gonna be looking here because I have notes and I don't wanna miss a step. So you must, must, must familiarize yourself with the eight steps in the IEP process. And step number one is requesting an evaluation in writing. There are templates, there are a plethora of templates online where you can find a template to request an evaluation in writing. And within that documentation, you want to request evaluations for any of the areas that you have concerns. For example, there's your education evaluation, there's the cognitive evaluation, there's the occupational therapy evaluation, which is often referred to as OT. If your kiddo is struggling to button up their clothes or tie their shoelaces, ugh, I can't talk with these braces, or tie their shoelaces, they may need an OT evaluation. They may um, mispronounce words, can't really get the words out. Um, you don't understand them when they speak. They might need a speech evaluation. So you want to be clear and put all of that in the letter. So you want to request an evaluation in writing. And number two is the actual evaluation. There's a timeline and so many days that the school has to get your child assessed. So you want to request an evaluation in writing. You want to get the actual evaluation done. You also um, want to attend the meeting where they determine eligibility. So just because a child has a learning difference doesn't necessarily mean that they're eligible for special education services. So that meeting after the evaluation is to determine eligibility. And when they determine eligibility, there are 13 codes, um, categories rather, under IDEA. So there are 13 codes under IDEA, and they have to pick one of those 13 codes. For example, my daughter was determined to have a specific learning disability in reading, and you often see it abbreviated as SLD. Well, what does that mean? That's what I said. What, well, what is that? What does that mean? Well, she has dyslexia. So you may often find that dyslexia falls under SLD. I did not know that. That's very important to, to know and understand. So once they determine eligibility, they must create and develop the IEP. And remember, you're a member of the IEP team. So you have some input and say when they develop the IEP. And the next step is implementing the IEP. It's one thing to have it all nice and in writing, but they must implement the IEP. Your child must receive their services and accommodations. And then the next step is monitoring progress um, and reviewing progress. This is huge. When we had an IEP and we got our report cards each quarter, we're supposed to get a progress report based on the IEP goals. I didn't know that. We were at IEP meeting maybe number three, and the principal asked me about the progress report. And I said, what progress report? What are you talking about? And then the IEP chair shared that, oh, I must have forgotten to get it to you. Right. So that's very important. I didn't know that. So you want to monitor and review progress and not just during that time when you um, receive the report card and the IEP progress report. You want to continuously look at your child's homework, look at the work that they bring home and, and review it and see if you recognize any patterns and if you see any progress. If not, you can always call an IEP meeting. The next step is your annual review. So at the end of the year, what worked, what did not work, what would you like to see changed? You know, be prepared and ready for that annual review. And then the last step is reevaluation. So there are eight steps 
in the IEP process that you must familiarize yourself with. I'm going to go over them again very quickly. Request an evaluation in writing, the evaluation, determinant eligibility, creating the IEP, implementing the IEP, we're at five, and then we want to monitor and review progress, annual review, and then reevaluation. So there are eight steps in the IEP process. You must familiarize yourself with those uh, eight steps. There are a lot of timelines included in there. There's a lot of um, legal things going on in there because that IEP document is a legal document, right? So documentation beats conversation. Document all your conversations. Uh, be organized get a binder, keep everything in a binder, then put that binder in a box and put everything in that box and then continuously organize it and update it. So my name is Winifred Winston. My daughter received uh, special education services via the IEP process. And I want you to do your due diligence to stay on top of this process so you don't experience any of the challenges that we did. So step one is actually writing the request. And Dr. Ingrid Amarini Klimek is going to speak about that. Basically, what you do is you write a request and you say, I feel that my child, you know, based on all my conversations with um, school personnel and, you know, my observations as a parent, I feel that my child needs um, extra support. And I would like to request an, a, a review, an evaluation for an IEP. And that means that all these different evaluations are going to get conducted. There's going to be a psychological evaluation. There's going to be a social evaluation. You're going to have to come in. You're going to have to talk about what you see, you know, as your home life's trends and difficulties and, you know, how you see your child's difficulties. Um, and there's going to be a class observation. All these things are going to come together. And then in the end, you are going to meet with the team. You as a parent are a, a central aspect of this team. So you are not just going to sit there and you're not just going to nod your head and listen to what you know the, the rest of the team has to say, but you are going to be able to give input and you are going to be able to talk to them and tell them, yes, I agree with everything you're saying. Let's talk about a plan. Or no, I think that maybe, um, you know, let's, let's, let's backtrack and let's see if something less restrictive or even more restrictive, whatever it is that you're considering, um, you know, they should be able to listen to you. Next, recognize that it is probably not going to be smooth sailing from here on out, uh, as we're going to hear from Dr. Carol Lieberman. So you really have to make an effort because sometimes first it takes an, a written uh, request for your child to be evaluated for an IEP. And if that is ignored or um, delayed, uh, it's not supposed to be delayed after a certain amount of time. And if, if they say no after they do, let's say they do do an evaluation and they say no, um, or they make you go out and get a private person to do an evaluation, Whatever it takes, you know, sometimes it can be a rather rocky road uh, to get to the actual accomplishment of getting an IEP. But you really, you shouldn't lose uh, hope and you should just be persistent, politely persistent, and keep on going. So at this point, you're getting to prepare for the IEP. And it's very important, as we're going to reiterate over and over here, is that the parent is the true expert. So preparing for the IEP. The start is preparing with your own observations, getting that documented. And Michelle Person is going to tell us about that now. As a parent, you should come with observations, very clear things that you have noticed that your child does when you're helping them at home, that you've noticed in previous years when you've tried to sit down with them in homework or when you've read to them at story time, how do they respond when you're working on homework? How do they, how do they act? What have you noticed about how they approach solving a math problem? Do they reverse their letters when they're writing? All of those things are, are pieces of information that the team will need from you. So when you are coming to the meeting, um, make sure that you have what works for you at home, what you've tried, because that can be considered part of the intervention process. Um, so anything you've done at home consistently to try to help your child reach 
um, a great level would be helpful to know any things you, you have observed, um, you know, things that you've noticed that you've seen your child do to either avoid work or to compensate for the fact that they're not sure how to do the work or, um, you know, things that you've noticed that they've struggled with. Those are the kinds of things that you need to, that you need to bring to the team at the meeting. Another important preparation you can do is actually learning the terminology. Every field has its own language. And so the last thing we want to do is to get into that meeting. Uh, it's going to be emotional at that point. And any terminology that's thrown at you may uh, cause more difficulties, may slip you up. So learning some, some of the term terminology ahead of time is going to be, be beneficial. So what we're going to hear from Dana Stahl, who is an educational consultant, diagnostician, and child advocate about the imp importance of learning the terminology ahead of time. Learn educational terminology. Every industry has its own language. It is imperative that parents learn the language of education in order to maintain an ongoing dialogue with your child's teachers and to effectively partner with their schools. Learn the terms that are used on a daily basis in school are contained in your child's 504 and IEP plans and help to facilitate and maintain home school communication. There are a couple terms that are really important to understand the meaning of. Katherine Garford, Garford is going to help us with those. If your child has an IEP or is going to have an IEP, it's important that you understand these four terms. The first two terms, accommodation and modification, are commonly confused, but they have very different implications. An accommodation is sometimes referred to as an adaptation, and it is the techniques and materials that are used to help facilitate your child's learning or their demonstration of learning. Accommodations do not change what your child is expected to learn. Accommodations do not provide your child with an unfair advantage over their peers. It serves to level the playing field so your child has access to the same learning materials and has the ability to demonstrate their learning. Modifications, on the other hand, change what your child is expected to learn. Modifications can happen for one subject or for as many subjects as your student needs. Modifications can be short-term, in place for while your child catches up to their peers, or they can last for their, your child's entire education. Modifications allow your child to participate in classroom instruction, even if they're acting on a different intellectual level than their peers. Another thing that can really trip you up during the, the meeting is some are some of the handouts that you're going to be given and expected to know uh, right at that point. And it, it's better to, again, be prepared than letting this being a, a big stumbling block. And Nicole Black is going to speak, us about, speak to us about the importance of that. Here's Nicole. When you walk in, they're going to give you um, a, a big stack of paper. It's your parent rights, things you need to know. And it's a lot of mumbo jumbo, a lot of, you know, very fancy words. And it can be really intimidating. And you have to sign that you received it and that you understand everything in it. But you're given five seconds to look it over. So ask for these rights ahead of time before the meeting. Say that you want to read them before you come in. You're going to find nuggets in there. I went over it one time with a fine tooth comb. And I actually didn't even do it for me and my daughter. I did it for a girlfriend. She was asking me a question and I didn't know the answer and so I carefully read through it. I found things like you don't have to sign the IEP if you don't agree with it or if you want some time to go over it. You can record the IEP meeting if you give them certain amount of time a warning and you do it in writing read through it and find the things that are going to be helpful for you. You can bring in an advocate with you with certain like if you let them know ahead of time. There are things that you can do before to prep if you have these rights. So ask for them before your first IEP meeting. Nicole Thompson tells us that additionally, it's important to get a copy of the, of the draft report before the actual meeting. 
to prepare for the meeting, make sure that they send you a copy of the draft report a couple of days beforehand so you can actually go over it and highlight the things that you have questions about or, you know, just highlight information that may not be relevant or information that you think should be included that they didn't include, but just look over that draft report and come prepare to ask questions. And if in the meeting they're discussing things and they're using jargon, excuse yourself and say, you know, I really don't understand. Could you clarify? Could you help me better? And one way that they could really clarify, and I use this quite often, is to use like graphs and statistics and things like that. And with the graph, I use the bell curve quite often and is very effective in explaining information to the parents. So just be prepared. Chris Reichert, who is a special education teacher and a disability advocate, tells us it's important to have an overview of our goals in the IEP and to actually document those. How can parents best prepare for their child's IEP meeting? First, review your child's previous IEP, if they've had one, progress reports, and current grades. Second, generate a list of questions based on the documents you have just reviewed. Third, research your child's disability to see how it affects his or her ability to progress in the general education curriculum. Fourth, Generate a list of goals that you would like your child to accomplish over the next year. This helps facilitate a conversation with school personnel about what goals you would like to see included in your child's IEP. And last and most importantly, know your rights as a parent of a child with a disability. Review the procedural safeguards document to become familiar with your rights as a parent. When it comes to IEP meetings, Special needs advocate Eileen Miller has seen a lot of them, and she knows the specifics. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of everything you need to bring to that meeting and be prepared for with Eileen Miller. Be extremely organized and comprehensive. By that, I mean there are several components that you need to put together prior to going into the meeting for your child. The first, make yourself a checklist. Write down everything that you are looking for your child to receive in regards to support services, classroom placement, in-home instruction if applicable, and anything else that you feel as though would help your child to succeed and get to the level that they need to be. That again can be maybe you prefer your child in a self-contained classroom. Maybe you feel as though you would like them mainstreamed and maybe just pulled out for certain services. Maybe you think as though your child should get speech twice a week and maybe OT once a week. But you should have all of these things written down so when you are at the meeting, you have it directly in front of you. Parents a lot of times get very flustered going into the meeting. School districts are notorious for not giving in and flustering parents and having them sign something that when they go home and think about it, it wasn't really what they wanted for their child. Get all of the documentation that you have together. What I mean by that is anyone who has seen your child, therapist, pediatric neurologist, perhaps maybe they were in a program, so a teacher from that program. Anyone that has had contact with your child and that has performed assessments or just has notes on their behavior, how they are socially um, doing with other children, perhaps their peers, everything, every piece of documentation you need to have at this meeting. The way to keep it organized is to make a folder for each individual person and take their documentation, make one copy of each thing that you will end up giving to the CSE chair at the meeting and keep it in a folder in chronological order. This shows a history of your child, maybe difficulties that they've had, maybe accomplishments that they've had, but you need all of this. You must have all of this documentation from all the pertinent individuals. 
If you do not feel that you have everything, please contact those individuals and have them email it to you. Explain when your meeting is. Explain that you need to be fully prepared. School districts take parents a lot more seriously when they come in with all their documents and fully prepare instead of just demanding, I want this or that for my child. Like I said earlier, schools usually do not give in and roll over to what you ask. There is some type of a, quote, fight, but if you can show them that you are taking this very seriously and you are invested in your child's future, then so will they, and you will have a much better chance of getting what you are asking for. Contact all these individuals and see if they are able to attend your meeting via the telephone. Usually I have found that if you give individuals enough notice, they can block out some time during your time of your meeting and they can come to the phone and give a first-hand account of their experience with your child. This is very important. Coming from a parent is important, but hearing it from the actual individual who specializes in certain areas, whether it be a psychologist for mental health, whether it be an occupational therapist or an ABA therapist, it is very important that the school hears everything these people have to say firsthand. If the individuals have a busy schedule and it is difficult for them to block out the time, then if you can ask them for a letter specifically stating what they in fact would say verbally during a meeting, then they can certainly do that and you can bring that with you to the meeting. Everything, all your records that you bring is very important that it is as updated as possible. Bringing a letter or bringing a test result from a year ago is not going to help your child and help the case. Things need to be in the present and if you know you have a meeting in enough time and you see as you go through your documentation that it is six months or older, then you need to contact those individuals to receive more up-to-date information. IEPs are tough enough on their own. Sometimes when they go bad, a need for an attorney arises. You don't want that as it's going to incur a huge expense for both you and the school and delay the, the needs of your child. Joseph Holscher was an award-winning high school teacher and has now transitioned into a child welfare lawyer. He's been through IEPs with his, his own child and has helped many parents navigate the system as well. And he gives us some advice, again, stressing the, very, the importance of really being prepared to prevent the need for a lawyer to get involved. Is be prepared, okay? Um, for whatever reason your child needs an IEP, you probably are working with some professionals who can help you get prepared. Uh, a doctor, an occupational therapist, speech pathologist, um, counselor. So before you go for your IEP meeting, um, and, and most schools have some kind of pre-meeting as well, so even before that meeting, go consult with your doctors, your counselors, and ask them, you know, my IEP is coming up. What should I be asking the school to do? What concerns should I raise? Um, you know your child better than anybody else. So you may have some ideas for what the school needs to be doing differently. Uh, I know we do usually, and most of the parents I work with do. So think about those, list them out. Um, spend some idea coming, some time coming up with ideas for how to address those concerns that you have and go into your ARD meeting or IEP meeting with a game plan and a checklist for things that your child needs. That'll help you stay on track in the meeting and know what to ask for. Most children who are struggling in school are going to have behavior problems. They are, these behavior pro problems are all really actually avoidance strategies for the most part. Their confidence has dropped off considerably. Their self-esteem is very low. It's in the gutter. 
they feel like they are very lacking in, in intelligence, although it's very likely that they're exceedingly intelligent. They just learn differently. But because they're trying to hide this supposed or their perception of a lack of intelligence, they're going to do that with behavior problems. Additionally, if, the, if a child has focus problems, um, then, then that will also lead to some behavior problems. So it is often a good idea to actually a, address these behavior issues actually in the IEP. Leanne Page is going to talk to us about doing that. If your child has an IEP and has problem behaviors in school, then those problem behaviors can be addressed on the IEP. So what does that look like and what do you need to know to make sure it's the best? Well, most likely they would have a behavior intervention plan called a BIP, B-I-P is your acronym for that. And a behavior intervention plan is just what it sounds like, intervene on the behavior. Help your child have more appropriate behaviors at school. When it comes to behavior intervention plans, there's a few key things you really need to be aware of as a parent. Um, things that I've seen as a former special ed teacher and also as a behavior analyst. Every school system does things differently, so be aware of what you can advocate for. First of all, a behavior intervention plan needs to be based on something, right? We don't just make up plans. They're based on data and assessments. And in this case, for behavior, it's called an FBA, a functional behavior assessment. So the science of behavior tells us that all behavior serves a function. And if we're going to intervene on it, we need to know that function so we can help the child get that need met in a more appropriate way. So an FBA is a whole nother document, piece of paper online um, within your IEP. An FBA is that assessment. I've seen it completed by special ed teachers. And as a former special ed teacher, I can tell you I was not prepared or adequately trained to do that. So as a parent, I would recommend you find out who is going to do that. I would like to see it be a behavior analyst or a school psychologist, a licensed specialist in school psychology, an LSSP, or really preferably a BCBA, which is a board certified behavior analyst. That's who's doing that assessment, who's figuring out the function of your child's behavior. So the FBA will include a target behavior, which is usually the problem behavior, and then the function. Why do we think that they're doing it? Are they doing it for attention to escape a situation or the demand? Are they doing it to get access or maybe a sensory input? The FBA will include those four functions of behavior. So that's step one. Where's the FBA and who's doing it? Step two is that your behavior intervention plan cannot just be about reducing problem behavior. And that's a problem that I've seen in IEP paperwork and in IEP meetings had to address before. So that's why I really bring that up as a red flag. It cannot be about just reducing problem behavior. Your behavior intervention plan should also include a replacement behavior. What is a new thing that we're gonna teach this child to do to get that need met? To serve the same function that we just figured out in the FBA, we just learned what that function was, how are we gonna help them get that function, that need met? How are we going to teach them to communicate their wants and needs and feelings and thoughts more appropriately than this problem behavior we're having? So within your behavior intervention plan, your BIP, your BIP, it should include, yes, the target problem behavior and how we're going to handle it when that happens and so how we're going to reduce that problem. But really the most important part is what are we going to teach them instead? This is about teaching our kids. This is about building them up, teaching that replacement behavior. So we should have a replacement target behavior. What's the good thing? How are we going to teach it? It's just like any other skill. There's specific ways to teach things, right? So what are the steps to teach it? And how are we going to reinforce this new behavior? What are the positive reinforcement systems? What are the positive things we're putting in place to make this new replacement behavior work for our children, to make it effective for them, to make them choose to engage in it more often. And so your positive reinforcement needs to be included under that alternative new replacement behavior. What are they going to get for doing the desired behavior? Are they going to get to earn um, points or tokens or stickers or these kinds of things in the classroom? Are they going to earn a break? Are they going to earn um, 
what are their most preferred things? So making sure that we are teaching the new behavior and we're using positive reinforcement to build it up, that we are focusing on the positives with these kids, that we are building up the good stuff. And when the, our child is having problem behavior, it's not just about squashing that and ending it and making that go away. That's not our goal with our kids, right? Our goal is to build them up and teach them and prepare them for life. And if we just squash all their problem behaviors, where does that lead them? We need to build up the replacement alternative behaviors, the appropriate ways to communicate your wants and needs and thoughts and feelings and all of these um, private behaviors is what we call them in behavior analysis, making sure that all of these things are addressed within the BIP. So again, recap, if your child has problem behavior at school, that can absolutely be addressed within the IEP. It should be addressed if it's interfering with their own learning or that of others. It should be based on an FBA, based on data, based on an assessment that tells us the function of that behavior. The FBA needs to be done by a qualified professional. Ask who's doing it. And if it's the special ed teacher, ask how well they're trained in it and what their training is and what it would take to get a school psychologist or a behavior analyst in there. Um, do they have one on, on staff? Do they have a behavior analyst close by? Do they have one on retainer with the district? You know, how can you get the most qualified person doing the assessment with your child? And then that person should also be writing up the behavior intervention plan. It should not be a list of check boxes of, yes, I'm going to give them extra time or we're going to make them sit out or something. This is no, it is individualized as everything in your IEP should be. Second big point your behavior intervention plan needs to include that alternate replacement behavior. What are we gonna teach them? What exact skill are we gonna teach that serves the same function that we figured out in the FBA? How are we gonna build it up using positive reinforcement? Make sure you're advocating for all these positives for your child, and I know they're gonna do great. And let's get a final word on really being prepared for the meeting by Emily. Denbo Morrison. Having a list is another way to make sure that your concerns will be addressed. You might think that teachers would be put off by parents bringing in a list of concerns or questions, but actually it's the opposite. We really appreciate when parents bring in what they're most worried about because this helps us Focus on specific areas that we can help your child. It also streamlines this process. We have a sub covering our class. You probably are taking time off work to have this meeting. So there's only a small window of time that we can discuss your child. And having a list of your questions and concerns really does help move things along. When you bring your child into the meeting, it helps us get a better picture of what they're struggling with when they can speak up and tell teachers, this approach didn't really work for me. I feel like if I had it written down or if I had the book on tape, um, children know better than anyone what they're struggling with. So bringing your child with you really does help us get a better picture of what's going on talking about what you see at home. What are their work habits? Do they spend five hours working on a math assignment? Do they spend all night trying to get 20 pages of reading done? Um, are they watching TV and playing video games and everyone thinks they're working? These are things that um, actually do help us. If they're not even trying their homework, it actually shows a level of frustration that we need to be aware of. So sharing what's going on on your end is really important. Also, when you go to an IEP meeting, there may be teachers there that um, you want to talk to about your child's struggles in their classes. Make sure that if you are talking to a teacher who you feel could be doing a better job at helping your child out, that you're still respectful, it's natural to be frustrated and it's natural to uh, get emotionally invested in uh, making sure your child has the best education possible. 
But when you make this into a personal attack or it comes off as sort of aggressive or offensive, anyone is going to go on the defensive and it can stall conversations out. It can prevent us from moving forward. So just be mindful of how you talk to the other teachers and special educators because Again, it's really important to establish uh, an atmosphere of respect. There may be people that you want to talk to that are not at the meeting. Make sure that you can have either an email or a progress report or some sort of written update from a teacher who you feel like it would be really important for you to talk to. Um, Sometimes not everybody can be there. So just keeping those lines of communication open. When is the next meeting? Who should I email? It's really vital that parents and teachers communicate. The number one determining factor in a child's uh, success is parental involvement. And number two is teacher involvement. So when parents and teachers are both talking about how to help their children, good things happen. It can't be stressed enough that the parent is the true expert with their child. So we're going to go through a rapid fire discussion from our experts on not only the fact that they are the child, the child's expert, but realizing that how they can be more of an expert and how they can stand strong as an expert. So let's listen to this rapid fire series from all of our experts who agree that truly the parent is the greatest expert for their child. You want to make sure that you remember that you are the expert in your child. You want to offer any specific information or insight that will be valuable into making the learning environment more comfortable for your student. Now, teachers and and, and the the educators and the staff at the school, yes, they're trained in specific content areas and they're the experts or they should be experts in specific given content areas, but you are the expert in your child and no one knows your child better than you. So oftentimes you're going to have greater insight or greater knowledge in how to help your child to receive the content that there's going to be delivered to them. So whatever help you can give to the teachers as far as um, maybe preferential seats or uh, or music or certain things, habits that that um, your child has that they can incorporate into the delivery of that content is going to go a long way to helping the teacher give your child the best possible chance to succeed with the content um, that they're going to be delivering. So you are a valuable member of your team, of the team. And so you need to understand that your input and and the anecdotes that you can give is not inferior at all. Um, And it's going to be helpful. And I remember for me as a teacher, I was always thankful when the parents came back with input or insight that I could then use when I was relating to, with my students and helping to deliver content to them. So make sure that you understand the value of what you bring to the table during those IEP meetings. But with that being said, you also need to know that you are a part of this IEP team. You are a valuable member. All of these educators and they're great at what they do and they are they've had years of experience and they have, you know, maybe some letters after their name. You are the expert in your child. You know what your child needs and they need to hear what you know. So if they are suggesting something and you say, "Wait a second, that's not going to work and I can tell you why." They are going to listen to you. They should listen to you. They have to listen to you. You are not there as a bystander kind of watching in on this meeting. You are a valuable part of this team and you have a say. And if you don't like the outcome, you don't have to sign the IEP. You can go through mediation. So assume that they want what's best, but go in knowing also that you are your child's voice You can do it in a kind way. You can say, oh, I'm so sorry, that's not gonna work for my child and here's why. But you can still get your point across and make sure your child's needs are met. One of the most important aspects of this is that parents are really the central 
point of IEPs, and nothing gets done without an I with without a parent's consent. So first of all, especially if this is an initial IEP. So in other words, if this is the first time that you're considering having an IEP for your child, it is the parent that initiates this. A teacher may approach a parent. A teacher may approach, um, you know, an administrator. An administrator may approach the parent. But nothing gets done without um, the parent's advice and the parent's consent. So that means a lot. That means that the parent, the parent's word is what matters, especially when it comes to the first time that an IP gets done. Uh, one of the things I also tell parents is that um, you should also keep in the back of your mind that say, for example, you went to, through the evaluations, you went to the IEP team meeting, um, an IEP is being drafted for your child, and then you go home and you feel like maybe something that, you know, maybe you're thinking about something else that, that it didn't occur to you at the meeting. You can always go back and have that revised. You have 10 days to, you know, write back to the team and say, listen, I didn't think about this at the meeting, but please incorporate this into the plan, you can always request a review. And last but not least, you can always withdraw your consent. So the fact that you've given consent once does not mean that that consent is forever. You can have your child um, be serviced through an IEP. And then two years from now, you feel like that was not um, something that should have been done and you can withdraw your consent is, and it's like you've never given consent at all. You're given 10 days to change your mind and if that, you know, doesn't happen, then your child becomes a general education student um, and if you would like to start over the process, then you have to start from zero. It has been my experience in general that school systems, again, in general, don't really promote or push IEPs. I think the reason is because they are legally binding documents. I think schools have limited resources, limited time. I mean, there's a much bigger question and conversation to be had about public education and, and how we're going about doing it and how we're funding it. But without going off on that tangent, I think because schools are stretched so thin, they don't jump right into an IEP. So if you feel like your child is struggling, you know if your child is struggling. And I think the first step is to not doubt yourself, um, but also to educate yourself and know that there is a difference between an IEP and a 504. Know that a school will have to evaluate your child in order to create an IEP for them. The first thing to do is to, to ask for your child's um, teacher, rather, to have a conversation, a sit down meeting with them. And I think it's important to sit down in person, let them know your concerns, find out their concerns, start to start that ball rolling. And then once you get that ball rolling, the school then has 60 days to evaluate your child. Now, one of the problems in uh, getting an IEP is that, and this is especially for crowded public schools, is that it takes time that schools, teachers already are feeling pressed for time and pressed for money. So an IEP uh, requires all of these people getting together to talk about your child, and that takes their time away from classwork or being a school psychologist or whatever it is that else that they do at the school. And so they're reluctant oftentimes to take all of this manpower into a meeting that's usually at least an hour and to give it to various kids, especially these days, because so many more kids these days are having problems learning whether it's because of issues like ADD or ADHD or depression, anxiety, uh, autism spectrum, um, all kinds of psychological issues. And, um, and so they are, they are potentially being and increasingly being overloaded with parents asking for IEPs. And so um, that makes them more reluctant. And, you know, there is a real issue of time and money, but that doesn't mean that your child should get lost between the cracks. Um, also, if there are two parents available, you should make an effort to make two parents be available for both parents to come to the IEP because there is strength in numbers 
uh, people are listened to more if there are two of you rather than if there is one of you. And also um, the second parent can back up things, can give other examples of instances when, for example, it took your child a long time to do their homework or they got you know, bad grades on tests or perhaps your child is already seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist and obviously letters from them are very helpful. But you know, even though it can be sort of a, a rocky road, as I said, um, not like the ice cream, um, you really have to keep persisting. Is I, I like to call this the uh, follow through. Follow through, how does that work? Well, at a young age, you can teach your children how to follow multi-step problems. Why would this be important toward being an advocate? Well, if you know how well your child is successful with following a multi-step problem, then nine times out of 10, you can then go to the teacher and say, my child is amazing when it comes to following directions. We've been doing this for years. So if you see any issues with that, you let me know because I know this one here, they can follow some directions. <laughs> or on the opposite, you can say, well, you know what? So since she was five, I've been giving my child directions Simple as wash the dishes, dry the dishes, and put the dishes away, and she can't get past step one. I think there is something wrong. Multi-step directions kind of let you know the beginnings of red flagging an issue, okay? So I would say being an effective parent is being prepared, and part of being prepared is knowing your child. Observe your child while they are doing their homework. Why when they do their homework? Well, Homework is reflective, or at least should be, of what they learned at the today at school. So whatever your child learned that day at school, homework should reflect what it is. If they're doing homework and you notice that they're struggling through a certain standard that that teacher's teaching, they're just not getting it. You see they're not getting it. It's just not hitting home and there's a major struggle, right? You, If you're observing while you're doing this homework, you can write a little note for yourself and then send an email to the teacher and like, you know what? You know, I noticed my daughter's really struggling in this manner. I really need your help. Can you help me? Or I notice she doesn't get the standard that you're teaching. How is she doing in the classroom? Because this may be a problem that I'd like to address immediately. All of this will create an understanding for you that's more holistic. So if in the event you have to go in front of a child study team and you're interviewed about your child, you can let everyone know that I am an expert I mean, the other educators on the team will say, yes, Ms. Harvey's an expert in this. How do I know? Is she is super involved and super helpful. And she even monitors and observes at home how her child is responding to the work that we send home. That works out in your child's best interest in the long run. It also shows that you are willing and able to advocate at any point in time for your child. A lot of parents are confronted with this group of individuals on the IEP team. They don't feel like they're as qualified as they are. Um, you know, these are people with authority, people with special credentials. But again, you're the expert on your child and you are a key member of your art committee or IEP team. So don't worry about asking questions, right? Asking questions is an opportunity for other people to really clarify and give you the benefit of their expertise. And it's a good way to make sure that everybody's expectations are on the same page. So ask questions and ask detailed questions. For example, um, my child needs breaks sometimes during class. So uh, right now, when they say we want to give him more breaks during class, make sure he has an opportunity for breaks, my question is, well, how are we going to do that? And he uses a break card that he holds up. He just needs a few minutes not to have anybody interact with him so he can kind of gather himself. Um, you know, a follow-up question to that is, how are we going to address that in class? Because... You know, he's the only one with a break card. So uh, I don't want my son coming home and being, you know, all upset and telling me that the teacher embarrassed him in class. So getting the teacher to think about that ahead of time is a good way to make sure that uh, the first time it happens is no scene or anything like that, no drama. Um, it just all these questions are an opportunity to get people to think about the nitty gritty of how this IEP is going to be implemented as well as what's on the IEP. So ask questions. Ask until you understand it. Don't stop until you are really clear on what's going on. And frequently, these meetings can become contentious, leading parents to feel as if they're excluded in helping to make decisions about their child's education. 
Federal and state educational laws stipulate that a parent is one of the most important members at the table when deciding eligibility for special education. In fact, school districts have been sued by parents because parents were neither included nor properly informed of their rights at the table. Is really sit down and get involved with your child's schoolwork. So when they're doing their homework, make sure that you're right there and you're really paying attention to what they're struggling in. Because the more specific you get, the more specific the information you can relay to the teacher, which will help in ways of helping your student. So let's say that they're struggling in math and you notice that the specific area that they're struggling in is, let's say, adding fractions. So you would identify the exact area where they're struggling in, and you will relay that information to the teacher. While you're relaying that information to the teacher, suggest ways that um, maybe will increase interest for your child. So you know your child better than any of the educators. You know them in and out. You know their weaknesses. You know their strengths. So according to their strengths, let's just say they're very creative or they're very organized. You tell the teacher, you know, little John is very creative. He's very organized. Given that, I think it'll be a good idea if you implement some of these um, things into the, the curriculum for him to see if it helps, to see if that intervention will help, right? So once it gets to the psychologist, she'll ask, Again, she'll interview you, the parent, to get pertinent information in evaluating your child. And the information that you should be um, very familiar with and very open with sharing um, with the psychologist is medical history, um, history about their work habits, their schoolwork habits. Have they always struggled? Is this something that just came up and you just started to notice it? It's things like that that really makes a huge difference. And in terms of medical, you want to um, mention if they've ever had an increased lead level because that actually matters. You want to uh, mention if they had any type of head trauma. A lot of us don't really take enough time out to realize how damaging head trauma can be, but it can be as little uh, um, an incident as little as maybe falling off a bed. But if the, the child fell off the bed and hit their head directly, it could have been enough of an impact to cause a concussion. And in some cases, concussions cause learning disabilities. So you want to be very mindful of that information when you're sharing it with the psychologist. How can you advocate for your child in the process? If you disagree with anything that the educators are saying, make it known and give your reasons why you're disagreeing. Again, because you know more than any of the educators know. But just be mindful that some things um, may show up in a test that you're not fully aware of. So just be open to receive the information. Do not sign anything at the meeting. Always tell the school and whoever is at the meeting, whether it's the CSE chair, psychologist, special ed teacher, an itinerant teacher, whoever is there, that you want to think about everything that was discussed during the meeting and you will get back to them within 24 hours which is a reasonable amount of time for you to go home, talk to your spouse or your family members, and really think without any distractions what was said and if what they proposed is what something that you would feel is acceptable. Please get back to them in 24 hours if that's what you tell them. It is based on an honesty system. You want a collaborative relationship with the school. And if you tell them you're going to do something and you do not, that will not allow them to believe you the next time you tell them something. It goes on the flip side that if the school tells you they will get back to you in the next day or two after you have brought something up to them, then you expect them to hold their word as well. Parents hold valuable information regarding their child's strengths, abilities, and needs. This information will equip teachers with a balanced and complete picture of what the student needs to be successful. Actively participate in meetings. You are your child's voice in those meetings until he or she is able to participate. Um, so it's really important that 
you be that voice, that you share the perspective from your child of what it's like to have the disability or to address some of the struggles and really to remind people of not only the areas where your child falls short, but also his or her unique strengths. Sometimes in IEP meetings, we focus so much on what's not working out or what the child isn't doing that we forget to focus on all of the strengths that each child comes with and determine ways that we can leverage those strengths to assist with some of those areas for weakness. So when you're in meetings, make sure that you're actively participating. Ask questions if you don't know. I was a former educator, so I know we have our own alphabet soup and everyone starts using um, teacher lingo. And if you don't know, ask people to slow down and make sure that you understand. It is important that you know and are actively participating so that you can provide actual consent. And if you are not clear on what's going on, I don't want you to be in a position where you get steamrolled because you didn't know. So ask. Just like we tell our students, our children, if you don't know, ask for help. Ask for help in those meetings to try to understand what everyone is talking about if you're unclear. Um, but getting an IEP in place, and then once the IEP is in place, your job is not done. It's important to follow up and follow through every year. I make sure all my teachers or my children's teachers rather know what interventions are in place and know how to best address and teach my child. Is to send a follow-up email. Okay. Now, when they hand you an IEP, if something's vague, like it just says, give some more breaks in class, feel free to write in detail and ask like, hey, my understanding is we're going to do it with a break card. Right. So is it okay if I just write this in here? I mean, they can't say no if that's what they said. So you write it in, you initial it, they initial it, not part of the IEP. You want the documentation. But if you forget something like that, if you don't do that, or the IEP has something that's vague, or you have a question that comes up after the meeting, as often happens, the best way to do that is to send a follow-up email with a copy of your notes, okay, and a request for everybody to review them as well as list out all of your understandings about how each step of the IEP is going to be handled, what everybody's obligations are, and who your points of contact are if an issue comes up. Who you go to first, who you go to second, so forth. And ask them, is everybody else in agreement that this is what happened? You know, do you guys have any questions? Is there any other obligations on my part? If they respond, you can engage in a conversation now that will all be documented through email and try to solve those issues. If they ignore you and don't respond, then it can be assumed that they agree with that. And you have the ability to come back later and say, hey, look, you're not doing this. And if they say, well, it's not in the IEP, you can say, yeah, but I sent the follow-up email and you never said anything different. And again, you just want to be there the entire time, checking in, making sure that everything is going well, making sure that all of the paperwork that is requested of you is being returned in a timely manner, and making sure that there is data being collected. Because honestly, without any data, it's not a, an informed evaluation. So what do I mean by data? Data could be um, old grades. It could be... Um, any type of progress monitoring that they're doing. So with the example, if they're having problems in math, it could be math probes. And what math probes are is just a sheet of paper with a certain amount of math problems on there and your child is expected to uh, solve as many as they can in one minute. So if they're doing that weekly and you know, you're know you seeing progress, good. If you're not seeing progress or if the child is stagnant, then you know that evaluation is actually called for. One of the things you want to make sure is that if your child has spent any time in the NICU, you want them to be in a place that is regularly assessing them. And so there are centers that use the ages and stages questionnaire which is something that you as a parent can use if you if your child isn't going to um, early childhood centers at home with you, you can you can order the ages and stages questionnaire and do the assessment yourself, and then you send it off to them and they send it back to you. So that's a, that's an avenue you can use. You can use an early childhood special ed program. Easter Shields does those and they are wonderful. Um, I I love them. 
then also you can just use a high quality center that is regularly using that ages and stages questionnaire. The most important thing in early childhood and getting your child assessed regularly is then any problems that they that come up with their development it gets noticed right away. And the sooner any issues are noticed, the sooner intervention happens, the better it is for your child because then they begin to develop the skills that they need. Okay. So um, with an IEP, um, they are updated every year, meaning the students, classroom teachers, um, the parent, and, and the student come to a meeting and they basically validate the, um, the modifications that the student is getting. Um, so for a parent to be prepared for those meetings, I think, you know, speaking now as a teacher, we um, probably, even though it's a legal document, didn't always execute the plan as well, probably because we, we didn't always read them, <laughs> um, especially not too far in advance of the meeting. But so what a parent can do um, to make sure um, you're checking off uh, these things and to make sure, you know, if your student doesn't need the IEP anymore, you have good information, is I would say well in advance of the meeting, if not directly with the teachers, maybe through whichever um, administrators working with you on the IEP, is to check in to see if the teachers are doing the modifications. So, for example, if the student, if it says the student should sit in the front of the room, um, maybe a month before your IEP meeting, check in with the teachers to see if the student is sitting in the front. So that way, when you go to your IEP meeting, you can actually assess if that modification was working um, and if it needs to be something else or if you don't need to do it at all. Um, so I would say well in advance of the IEP meeting, check in with the administrators and the teachers to make sure the student is getting all of the modifications so that when you go into the meeting, you could actually assess if they're needed or not. And how can you make sure that your student is successfully executing what they're supposed to be doing? and maybe working their way towards getting out of a program like that? I think um, there are modifications or um, suggestions for students. Um, and I think the biggest one that students don't necessarily do is they're supposed to say like when they need the extra time on an assignment or, or during a test. And oftentimes kids are sort of embarrassed, right? They're like, I don't want to have to get up in the middle of the room. Everybody sees me or, you know, asking for time and that kind of thing. So I think what a student should do is definitely establish some kind of communication directly with the teacher, email, you know, all these other applications that do that kind of stuff um, to advocate for themselves in advance. You know, I can say as a teacher, I used to hate when a project is due that they've been working on for two weeks and the student um, after the due date is like, I have an IEP, I need extra time. It's not genuine, right? So I think in advance of those, if everybody's just reminding, keeping everyone in communication about what accommodations there are, I think we'll you get the best use of those things. In all the hustle and bustle, the emotions, the diagnostics, the administrators trying to push things through, the parents trying to get what's right for their child, one of the things that can easily happen is for the people in the team to actually forget that this is a real child. Uh, and so it's important to remember that. And it's actually, as a parent, you can be very tactical about making sure that this doesn't happen and helping the all those involved to actually empathize with the situation. And Nicole Black has some fantastic suggestions for doing that. So let's listen to Nicole. When there is an IEP, usually because there's so many moving parts to how many people's schedules need to be rearranged to make sure everybody's there, they back to back to back the IEP meetings. And after a long day of IEP meetings, that can get kind of tedious for the people who are in all of them. And sometimes they forget that they're talking about a real kid. They're talking about your kid, your baby, right? So sometimes what I do is I bring in a picture of my daughter. She's still young enough where she doesn't accompany me to her IEP meetings. That may change soon as she's getting older. But I bring in a picture and I say, this is my daughter, Addison. This is what she loves. She loves to dance and to sing and to bake. And she's a Girl Scout and she loves, loves, loves reading. 
this is what you need to know about her. She's a real kid. And having that picture sometimes is just the reminder that these educators need, that when they're talking about all of the things she can't do and all the things that she's gonna struggle with, she's a real kid. I'm a real mama and that kind of stings a little bit. Even if I know it's true that she can't do these things, they come at it from a different perspective with hopefully a little bit more grace and a little bit more kindness because they see the picture of her smiling back at them. That's especially true if this is your first IEP meeting or if it's new administration or if you're switching schools, bring in a picture of your child. One of the things that I encounter very often when parents are considering having an IEP uh, for their child is a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety around um, you know, how to go about uh, requesting an IEP. Is this the right thing to do? Um, and the feeling that um, an IEP is something that's to be done to a child and not for the child. You need to sort of prepare your child. You know, it's important to not make your child feel as though they are being singled out, you know, special ed, that they're not special in a bad way, that, um, that some of the most brilliant people, you know, some scientists and uh, all kinds of people who have high positions have had different kinds of learning disorders. So you really need to sort of, because they're gonna be interviewed at, uh, when they're being evaluated for the IEP. So it's important to not make them feel like they're dumb or that they are sitting in a corner with a dunce cap or anything like that, any of those kinds of stereotypes, but that um, you are just trying to, different people have different ways of learning and you are just trying to help them find the way that works best for their success. Creating a work environment that's conducive to your child's zen and happiness because when your child is stressed out at school, they don't want to come home and do more work. So if you create a positive, zen-like learning environment, learning and education won't seem so negative, especially if they're struggling at school. Trust me, they're going to push back greatly and you don't want that to happen. So create an environment where you show it feels in like, and then your behavior and your attitude towards what's going on with your child doesn't show frustration, but more like warmth and caring and then a need to help, want to help them. If they feel that you really want to work with them and help them, trust me, they will follow through. If you do have a struggling student, okay, they don't have great follow through, their homework skills are not, you know, they're kind of subpar, their learning environment they can care less about, mm, subpar. That truly means that you need to run to this tip, step, tip five, and that is create a situation where they are winning. A lot of times, you know, you might want to look at what they excel and are successful in. What do they like? What hobbies they like? Allow them to do that with extracurricular activities so they can feel what success feels like. It gives them an opportunity to be successful. And sometimes extracurricular activities are helpful in trying to get them to understand the work that they do do on a daily basis in the classroom. What Nishima just said there is vitally important. Not only are those little wins going to possibly help by transferring into the classroom, but they're also going to build confidence and they're going to de develop more of a love of learning for the child. What's actually happening in the brain there is when you get those little wins, you're getting a dopamine hit and becoming addicted to those dopamine hits is what makes us love learning because it actually feels enjoyable. So what she's saying there is really critically important and can be mad magical. So I really uh, highly recommend that you do follow those instructions. They're, they're fantastic. There's one other reason why they are so important and why they can be so helpful is the the science tells us the neuroscience tells us that confidence is actually transferable so we all know that a child who is struggling in school is quickly losing self-confidence and so we need to do everything i can as a matter of fact it might be one of the most important things that we do is to build up that that confidence so by getting those wins in other 
uh, areas of life, no matter where they are, confidence is, tra is transferable. And so you can use this little trick of when you can build up confidence in other things, then create a list, the I am good at list. As a matter of fact, this is an exercise we always recommend in the learning success system. Um, the I am good at list, create a list of I am good at things for your child from all those extracurricular things. Now, when they come to a situation where they are becoming, where they're not confident in what they're about to do, maybe that's doing their homework, or maybe that's going to school, maybe that's a test coming up, whatever it is, pull out that list. Read that chip that list or have your child read that list. Better if they'll read it. That actually brings the confidence chemicals into the body and into the brain. And those are actually going to transfer over a bit to the next activity. So um, it's a neat little trick. And uh, you can do that with your child. So again, lots of, lots of really good reasons um, to do what Nashima has just told us about, which is those extracurricular activities, getting some wins out there. So again, let's always keep in mind that your child is a real child, that sometimes people need to be reminded of that, and we need to loop them in. They are a part of this process, as we're going to hear from Tara Amrick, who has a lot of experience as a parent in dealing with IEPs. Um, looping your child in in a way that hopefully makes them feel like they're just like everybody else. They just need a little extra support because there are still stigmas attached to having an IEP. So often we can lose sight of the child in this process and it can feel like IEP meetings are solely about focusing on what they're struggling with or what needs improving and there are so many strengths and positives that we forget to mention. So talk about what they're good at. Talk about the areas that you've seen real growth. And make sure that your child hears you saying these nice things because children are more than their learning differences and they need to know that. So making sure that you end on a positive note and you know what you want to do moving forward. These are really important to helping your son or daughter deal with their learning difference and ultimately have a very successful, positive outcome with their education. It's also important to remember that children that have a learning difficulty of some sort typically will have a gift that comes along with it. It's not going to feel like a gift at first, but as you go along and you correct the learning difficulty itself, you'll find that their brain compensated in some way and that compensation always or almost always results in a gift. They'll have an intelligence, a, so, a sort of intelligence that others won't. We're going to listen to Barbara Harvey on that who points that fact out very clearly. Remember that a lot of people think that children with with a disorder or a disabled it's really that they're differently able. It means that they have to learn a different way to do what everybody else does. And really, that's all a speech therapist or an occupational therapist or behavioral therapist or any of the professionals that are working with young children are doing. It's giving them the tools they need to do what everybody else does in their way. And so that's the importance of it. The other thing is people who have disorders, I'm visually impaired. So my role model, you know, everybody knows Helen Keller, but most people don't know that Franklin Delaver Roosevelt was visually impaired. Claude Monet was visually impaired. You know, one of the most famous artists in the world had visual issues. So... Your child does not, life doesn't have to be stunted because they have this problem. They just have to develop different abilities to do what everybody else does in a different way. It's not a, a death sentence. It's not uh, your child will never be able to 
do things. I knew a, a young man with Down syndrome who runs his own business. I know a young lady who's autistic who is a model. I knew a lady who is, um, she, she walks on crutches, but she's one of the best teachers I have ever had. So don't look at your child as disabled. Look at them as differently abled and empower them to do whatever it is they need to do. The only limit to your child is low expectations. So don't limit them. They already have a challenge. Make that challenge as small as you possibly can and then help them take on the world. It's a very unfortunate fact that our nation's prisons have a very high percentage of adults with different learning disabilities, such as dys dyslexia, that did not get the help. Um, it's 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 not hard to believe because a lot of these children do suffer from some extreme low self-esteem low self-confidence and that just leads to really bad things as a matter of fact there's there's uh information on the internet and about some states actually gauging how many prisons to build based on child reading scores in like fourth grade. We don't actually know if that if that can be substantiated or not. Um, it, it may be more internet rumor than not. But uh, it is factual that extremely high levels of prison populations are dyslexic or have other disabilities. So it's important to include this section on what if your child is have is a juvenile delinquent and an IEP and how those two things mix. So we're going to uh, hear from an attorney, Susan Williams. I'm attorney Susan Williams, and my job as a criminal defense attorney is to represent people who are in trouble with law enforcement. And throughout my career as a criminal defense attorney, I've had opportunities to represent juveniles in the state of South Carolina who have IEPs in place. And I wanted to let parents know or guardians know through this video, the kind of things that you should be looking out for when your child has an IEP and is facing a criminal charge. So I'm gonna go through the stages of a juvenile criminal case from start to finish, and I hope this helps a lot. So we're gonna start with the interrogation process. Um, first of all, we wanna think about who is interrogating your child? Is it someone at school? Is it a school resource officer, a teacher? If it's not on school grounds, maybe it's at a uh, baseball game, a football game. Is it a school resource officer? Whoever it is that's interrogating your child, do they know that the IEP is something that's applicable for this child? And if so, do they follow the IEP how the procedures that are in place for this plan. So that's gonna be an important factor um, just from the very start of this case. And um, you wanna make sure that the person who's dealing with your child knows about uh, this plan because it can affect how your child is comprehending what's going on. Um, and if your child ends up getting charged with something, it is very important that you as a parent or guardian get that child's mental health records to the proper folks. I would recommend sending them to the child's lawyer so that the child's lawyer can look through, review those notes and send them on to the proper folks, whether it be Department of Juvenile Justice or the prosecutor. But I would let your attorney go through those uh, records first so that the attorney can determine what needs to be distributed. And uh, you will definitely be speeding up the process by signing for these records and because they're HIPAA rules that prevent even, well, they don't prevent them, but they, they put up a lot of red tape for even lawyers. So you would be doing everyone a favor to allow the attorney access to these mental health records. So, 
the going back to um, the interrogation, uh, let's talk about the Miranda rule here. So if your child is making statements, we want to look at whether or not your child understood the, the waiving of their rights. Did your child understand that what they were being questioned about could later be used against them? If they made a confession, did they know that this would be used in court? Did they know that they had the right to an attorney? A lot of times people will say, well, I didn't know who my attorney was going to be. And the thing about Miranda is that you don't have to name an attorney. You just want to say, hey, I want to stop questioning. I need an attorney. And all of that stuff can be sorted out later on. But it, it should stop questioning. And if your child doesn't understand that and they've given a confession or they've said things um, that are against their best interest, then that's something that can make or break the case because um, through pretrial motions, an attorney advocating for your child may be able to get those statements suppressed through, through a suppression hearing. And so, uh, you know, the IEP certainly comes into play here because we would be looking at whether the child understood their Miranda their warnings. So going on now to the arrest um, in South Carolina, we have a pickup order. Um, your child or your child may not, you may not be signing a pickup order because your child may remain detained. But um, when I'm looking at defending folks who have IEP, I always look at that the child have the requisite intent. A, um, an evaluation may be in order, uh, competency evaluation may be something that an attorney can do before the detention hearing or the adjudication hearing um, goes forward. If, you're, if the attorney has questions about the child's competency, whether they had the um, way of knowing right and wrong, and, and there are many other things to this, uh, an attorney should, out of an abundance of caution, do you get this type of uh, examination or evaluation done. So if there are co-defendants uh, that were arrested for the same thing at the same time when your child was arrested, what is going on with their case? Are they being treated the exact same way that your child is with an IEP? And, you know, a lot of times I will separate my defendant, if I can, from the co-defendants so that I can see, uh, you know, what is going on, what happened, how were they sentenced, and, uh, you know, what, what happened with their case. And a detention hearing is when uh, your child will be in court with their lawyer, a judge, Department of Juvenile Justice, the prosecutor, and you as parents or guardians will also be allowed to be present. And the judge may hear from you on, on what you think should be the best outcome on this case. And the judge will hear from the attorney. The judge may hear from my client from DJJ, from the solicitor's office. So a lot of players uh, come, come in here to this detention hearing. And one of the things I wanna go over are zero tolerance policies. Those are things that are put in place for certain, certain courts have them, I mean, sorry, certain solicitor's office have them or prosecutor's offices. Um, one of the counties where I prosecute, they have a zero tolerance policy for weapons on school grounds. And that means that they will not dismiss those cases. They will not, recommend anything other than a 45-day detained evaluation. So it would be my job to convince the court otherwise and use your child's IEP as mitigating factors if, if those are applicable. I personally go over uh, the colloquy with my client um, so that they understand what is going to be happening. If, if I get a feel um, or that this child um, doesn't understand what's going on, then I, I will go over the colloquy with them uh, just before court so they don't forget. I don't go over the co colloquy with all of my clients, but I do find that uh, they're more comfortable with knowing, you know, what is the judge going to ask me? How should I present myself in court? I, I always give a handout to my clients and the children um, so that they, the clients and their parents rather, so that they know like what to expect, you know, nonverbal answers are not going to work because we have a court reporter, you know, stand up when addressing the court. Those things are very important in 
presenting in court. Um, so then, you know, just looking at the sentencing and placement, if your child is going to be detained, then we want to look at whether this place that they're going to is going to be able to meet the, prerequ the prerequisites of the IEP. Ideally, uh, the placement would be consistent with the child's IEP and special needs. Of course, you know, we don't always have that choice, but that's something to take into consideration. Spaces are limited in uh, places and, you know, unfortunately, we don't, we, we don't always have the ability to pick out where your child is going. That's something that should always um, be in the back of your mind. Finally, um, an IEP should be reviewed at least once a year, it doesn't matter where your child is, whether they're incarcerated, whether they're not incarcerated, um, where they are, it doesn't matter. Parents should be involved with these IEPs in incarceration or placement at a boys or girls home or DJJ facility, Department of Juvenile Justice facility should not have any, um, should not, you know, stop parents from doing this. Thank you very much for watching. We hope that this has been very educational and we hope this has been beneficial to you and your child. Please share it if you like it, if you know somebody who might benefit. And thanks again for watching. Best of luck. Uh, I hope you found these tips helpful and um, onwards and upwards. Have a good day. I give. I thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. And I hope this is not the last, uh, um, the last opportunity that I have to talk to you and wish you the best in your pursuits for your child education. Thank you. Have a great day and thank you for watching. Have a great day. And I hope that all remains well for you and your children. So good luck this school year, y'all. And I can tell you right now, you're on the right track because you're watching this video. That means you're one of the parents who really cares is really trying to do the best. So congratulations on that. I wish you all the best. I thank you. Have a good one. And I wish you and your family the best of luck in getting all the services that your child so richly deserves. And know that more often than not, there's nothing wrong with your child. Thanks.